D'Andrea, who is filling in for Director Obrick today. So welcome, Jim. Glad to have you with us today. <laughs> so, directors, I'm going to read the two public hearing addresses and have both public hearings opened. And then we'll see if there are any comments from the public before we move on to Planning and Development Committee. Okay, so the first public hearing address is for Area H. This is a public hearing for proposed Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen Bylaw Number 2498.16-2021. The proposed bylaw and related information, including written comments received to date, are available for review on the Regional District webpage. At this public hearing, all persons wishing to speak will be given an opportunity to do so and are asked to commence their remarks by stating their name and address. Written comments may be submitted before closure of the hearing. Anyone wishing to speak at this public hearing is asked to do one of the following. If you are participating by a computer, please click the raise hand button, which can be found in the participants panel on the right hand side of your computer screen. This will indicate that you wish to speak. If you're participating via phone, please press star three on your phone's keypad. This will also indicate that you wish to speak. Having indicated that you wish to speak, you will then be placed in a queue until you are invited to speak. All speakers will be restricted to a time limit of five minutes until everyone who wishes to speak has had an opportunity to do so. Anyone wishing to speak a second time may do so by following the same protocol of selecting the raise hand button on your computer or by pressing star three on your phone's keypad. To submit written comments, please email them to planning at rdos.bc.ca prior to the close of the public hearing. I will now ask Corey Lebrecht to outline the specifics of the proposed bylaw. Go ahead, please, Corey. Okay, we can't hear you. Hi, right, sorry about that. I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint. There we go. So the proposed revisions to electoral area H zoning bylaw. Um, the purpose is to correct typographical errors and mapping issues, revise maximum floor areas and number of units for secondary suites and accessory dwellings, and introduce scientific research facility as a permitted use in the resource area zone. New since the first and second reading are some amendments uh, in terms of mapping to four split zone properties in Eastgate located at 112 Thistle Road, 110 Thistle Road, 5058 Highway 3, 5070 Highway 3. What we're looking to do here is take the existing split zoning that you see on your left, um, which is clearly not aligned with the property boundaries due to uh, 2016 subdivision, and realign the zoning to the property boundaries, which you see on your right side of the screen, so that the zoning is nicely aligned with the property boundaries. And the way we're proposing to do that in the bylaw is to change the zoning from 110 Thistle Road from part residential single family one and part tourist commercial one to all tourist commercial one. For 112 Thistle Road from part residential single family one, part tourist commercial one to all residential one. For 5058 Highway 3, uh, zoning from part tourist commercial one, part residential single family one, and part small holdings four to all tourist commercial one. And finally, at 5070 Highway 3, zoning from part residential small holdings four and part tourist commercial one to all small holdings four. Next, we've got a typographical error uh, that we are proposing to correct and it's a reference that allows for one shower in an accessory building in the Ag 1 and Ag 2 zones. And we're changing that to refer to the Ag 3 zone as Ag 3 is the only agricultural zone on electoral area H. Next is a typographical correction from one seasonal cabin to two seasonal cabins for a property located at Lot 2, District Lot 2076, Plan Cap 78220. 
And we're looking to update the secondary suite and accessory dwelling regulations, uh, including the maximum unit numbers and increasing the maximum floor areas in the rural areas. Finally, we're looking to introduce scientific research facility as a permitted use in the resource area zone. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Corey. If we can bring that down from the screen and then I'll proceed with the area I public hearing address and then we'll open up both public hearings to the public. This is a public hearing for proposed regional district of Okanagan Similkameen bylaw number 2457.35 2021. The proposed bylaw and related information, including written comments received to date, is available for review on the regional district's webpage. At this public hearing, all persons wishing to speak will be given an opportunity to do so and are asked to commence their remarks by stating their name and address. Written comments may be submitted before closure of the hearing. As stated with the previous public hearing address, uh, you can participate by computer by pressing the raise hand button, which is in the participants panel on the right hand side of your screen. That will tell us that you'd like to speak and you can also do so by your phone by pushing star three on the keypad. Once you have indicated you wish to speak, you will be put into a queue. Everyone will be given five minutes. Once we've worked through folks, you have an opportunity to speak again, if you wish, following the same protocol. You can submit written comments by email to planning at rdos.bc.ca prior to the close of this public hearing. I will now ask Rushi Godoya, planning technician, to outline the specifics of the proposed bylaw. Go ahead, please, Rushi, or Corey, are you filling in? Uh, I think Rushi might be in Chris's office. Okay. I see Chris is coming in on the screen. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the proposed uh, application in front of us is to subdivide an existing duplex uh, in order to create two balanced strata lots at property located at 165 Snow Mountain Place. Uh, the current uh, zoning of the property is low density residential duplex, which allows for duplex uh, residentials on subject property. The site specific regulation uh, of so this zoning would allow the creation of two strata lots uh, of sizes 236 square meters and 281 square meters each, whereas the minimum parcel size under current existing RD2 zoning is 300 square meters. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rushi. I now declare both public hearings open and ask if there's any members of the public who wish to speak to either of the proposed bylaws. Just having a look at those that are in the lobby to see if anyone wishes to speak. Danny, do you see any? Okay, I'm going to ask a second time if there's anybody present who wishes to speak to either of the proposed bylaws. I'm still not seeing any. And I will ask a third and final time if there's anybody present who wishes to speak to either of these proposed bylaws. Danny, nothing? Okay, seeing none, I declare both public hearings closed at 9.11 a.m. Thank you very much. Okay, so directors, that takes us to our first committee meeting, which is Planning and Development Committee, and I'm going to turn things over to Chair Canodal. Go ahead, please, Chair Canodal. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to look for a motion to do accept the agenda for the committee meeting for February 14th, 2021. Moved by George Bush, seconded by uh, Director Horm Holmes. Uh, I'd like to uh, advise the committee that there are still concerns about the container uh, issue uh, as discussed at the committee uh, meeting on January 21st, and that I intend to have both the building bylaw and bylaw 
2895, the zoning bylaw brought back to on the February 18th committee agenda for further discussion. Uh, at this point, I'll ask for uh, a vote to accept the February 4th agenda, please. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion carried, agenda accepted. First item on the uh, uh, agenda is the uh, building inspection service fee increase. I'll go to uh, CAO Newell for uh, a, a rundown on this, please. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, the building inspection service uh, was raised during the 2021 budget discussions. Uh, there is some concern that uh, because uh, we have used either large surpluses out of the service or a reserve uh, to cover some of the operational costs that now that uh, we don't see a large surplus uh, coming from year to year or that we are starting to use up uh, the reserve uh, because we're not transferring enough back in, is that we're starting to see those peaks and valleys as far as uh, the impact on our ratepayers uh, in this service um, due to an increasing requisition. So we've asked our manager of building inspections enforcement uh, to come up with some options that uh, committee could consider. And uh, Ms. Miller is going to come in and present uh, the options that she's identified and give you some more background on uh, what we might be able to adjust. So we'll turn it over to Ms. Miller and Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I'll just share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that uh, presentation. Um, this presentation is fairly short. It's based on most of the tables that are in the report that was sent out to everybody. And uh, the first slide. Uh, you may, this, this slide, this table is familiar from the December 17th report that I did. Um, the numbers on the on the first top of the table were the numbers that Mr. Zavino had provided to me, and the revised budget has a tax requisition at 308. You can see in the bold down below, um, and that is based on um, the total budget less the miscellaneous revenue and the permit software carry carry forward. Uh, so it's it's based on a 30 70 split. Okay, so we uh, did evaluation based on the RS means cost estimating handbook and that that book is a uh, it's a comprehensive database that uh, compiles all the construction values throughout North America and it includes factors for over 730 cities in both the US and Canada. Okay, so after after the review for uh, 2021, we adjusted the our proposed adjustments are set out in this table. And the last increase that we did to these uh, valuations were done in May of 2010. So it's it's long overdue to have increases there. So this is a, a comparison of permit fees based on the our current bylaw provisions, and those are the peach colored numbers. And so our current current permit fee would be four thousand seven hundred eight first based on the current valuation. With the proposed RS means adjustments, that value would go up to five hundred twenty eight thousand, with permit fees of just under sixty three hundred. And that's based on the current permit fee valuation of twelve dollars per thousand. If we increase that to thirteen dollars per thousand, which had been suggested previously, those fees would go up to just under seven sixty eight hundred dollars. And then I've included comparisons for our member municipalities for the same project. So um, even 
with the increase for or the proposed increase for RS means, our permit fees would be the highest fee based on value. Um, this portion was not in your report. I was thinking about it the other day. If we increase the valuation, it makes sense to increase the threshold to uh, have the breakdown. Th this breakdown was uh, done in October of 2018 to give a break to the very large projects that occasionally come in. So um, we're proposing that the split go from 500,000 to 750 and 750 to 1.5 million and then the six dollars per thousand over 1.5 million and this is a breakdown of how those fees would be reflected if we did that threshold increase and then these are some proposed other increases for various fees that we have in our uh, fees and charges bylaw. Um, flat fees for swimming pools, increasing plumbing permit fixtures, and uh, some various other ones. So with those increases, it could be an increase of um, 30 to 35,000 per year. It, it's hard to calculate it because it all depended on the number of permits received. And that is it. So if anyone has any questions, I'll stop sharing my screen. I think you're still on mute, Director Canoodle. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Miller. At this point, I'll ask for if there are any questions for Ms. Miller or CAO Newell on this matter. Seeing none, uh, there no, are... No, there's questions, Director Canola. Oh, We've got sorry. Director Gettens, followed by Director Monti. Director Gettens, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, through the Chair, I'm just curious from Laura, if there, if other municipalities have the different tiers you were talking about, where the, the bigger you build, the less you charge per square foot? Well, th through the Chair, um, there, municipalities have various methods of calculating the fees. So when I presented to do this change back in 2018, there was uh, several municipalities that do do this tier. I'm not sure that any of our member municipalities do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Monteith. To the chair, I guess I'm wondering about um, historical information about the last time that we did a rate increase and whether there was a, also an equal increase in people not getting on um, proper permits because of, you know, costs, right? So I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, in COVID times when people are doing home renovations, we're looking at making it more expensive for them, which may deter people from getting permits, which puts us back into the same compliance issues that we face all the time. I just, I'm concerned it might be bad timing to look at an increase, just looking for information. Ms. Miller? Uh, yeah, so the last increase to the valuation was done in May of 2010. And, uh, and then we did the, the scaled model in 2018. So um, since then, there have been no increases. Does that answer your question, Director Monty? No? No. Um, do you have a follow-up question? Sorry, I guess I'm looking for, um, you know, like 2011 when the after the rate increase, was there increase in in bylaw complaints because of infractions with building permits? I guess I'm looking for a correlation between cost and, and people not getting permits as they were as they're required. Uh, through the chair, um, it's it's not really. Uh, data that we collect because if people aren't 
getting permits. There hasn't been an increase in enforcement. That's been pretty static. Um, as far as construction level, it's been steadily increasing since 2011. Every year, we're getting more permits and uh, probably more enforcement as well because people are building. But whether it's due to permit costs, we get very little complaints about permit costs when people are coming in to pick up and pay for their permits. It's pretty comparable throughout the valley. Well, thank you. Uh, Director Vasilaki, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, going a little further with uh, uh, Director Monteith, the city of Penticton for year 2020, because of COVID, um, we completely cut out uh, uh, the costs of permitting or any of the other things when you had re uh, renovations under $100,000. Uh, so perhaps uh, something like that could happen in this case. Uh, I know with with this um, thing coming forward, it doesn't affect the city of Penticton, but it will affect the rural areas um, in the district. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director uh, Vasilaki. Uh, do you care to comment to that, Ms. Miller? Uh, I think I will defer to our finance manager, Jim Zafino, on that be because we have a, a, a budget that we have to meet. Do we have Jim available or is that for a later discussion? He's in. Jim, would you care to comment on that, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So if, if uh, the board decides to, to do the same as the city of Penticton, uh, that's not going to decrease the costs uh, there. So there, we anticipated uh, loss for that year, and then we'll do that deficit would have to be carried over for the following year. So someone would have to pay for that free service. Thank you, Mr. Zafino. Uh, Director Gettins, is that a, another question, or we'll have to go ahead? Thank you. Thank you, the chair. Um, I'm in favor of raising the fees and going um, heading towards the 70-30 split. If we don't raise the fees, then our rate payers and our taxpayers are going to have to pay more. So we have to figure out a balance between what works for the person who's not doing the renovation as well. Because just like as Laura said, a budget needs to be met. So um, I'm in favor. I don't think we're out of line. I think we've got extra costs having such a large area that we need to go and inspect. I know there's a lot of travel involved as well. And I did spend some time just looking into this a bit more because it was it was hard to see the jump in the budget. but. Um, yeah, I'm in favor of, of kind of having it more on the onus of the people doing the development and doing the renovations and then having the ratepayers pay um, their share of the 30%. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gettins. Uh, Director Vasilaki, is that a leftover or is, do you have a follow-up? Actually, um, because of the concerns that the taxpayer might have to pick up the cost, um, the COVID uh, um, restart funds that uh, everybody got uh, for uh, for the next year or so, uh, it can come out of that, and that way no taxpayer has to uh, um, be concerned about paying those extra costs. <clears throat> excuse me, that are going to be lost. Uh, mind you, those funds can be used uh, for something else, but for the present time, uh, this is a good uh, restart, and the um, folks can hire people to do work, therefore creating more work uh, for the area. Thank you. Mr. Zafino, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I do. The regional districts did not get the same amount of funds that the municipalities. Uh, as you know, we received 700, just over $700,000 and the majority of that was redistributed back to electoral areas and to use for COVID related expenses in your own areas. So as of the last meeting, the board did accept uh, the, recommend the staff recommendation and it's going to be presented for a second reading. But as of this moment, there is no extra funds available uh, to subsidize the building inspection revenue. Thank you, sir. Director Coyne Sr. Yeah, I'll be voting to support this uh, motion, 
we have absolutely um, had no slowdown in our area in the building trades and uh, I see absolutely no reason why the general taxpayer should be subsidizing the, the uh, new construction that's going on. The, everybody that builds knows darn well that they have to pay their, their building permits and it's a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Director Coyne Senior, or uh, Junior, please. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, you know, the extra cost to have a building inspector, just say in Area H to go from one end of the district to the other, it's not the same as a municipality where, you know, he can jump in his truck and he can be at the job site in five, 10 minutes. I mean, sometimes the building inspector takes an hour or two just to get from one job site to another. So that's an extra expense that's being borne by the taxpayers right now. It needs to be borne by the people doing the development, not by the taxpayers. Thank you, Director Coyne. I see a hand for the RDOS boardroom. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Canodal. I just want to add, I, I agree with uh, Director Gettins and both um, Director Coins. It, you know, this came to committee at, at the request of our board because it needed to be dealt with. And if we haven't had an increase, and in, I think it's been 10 years, it's, it's time that we deal with this. So I fully support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Blackridge. Are there any other questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, I will look for a, a motion to uh, move forward. Director Pendergraf moved. Is there a second? Director Coyne? All the question, all in favor? Opposed? I think we have Director Vasilaki opposed. I see that. Is Thank that you very much. Yes. Uh, anyone else opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries. Thank you. I'll be uh, at this point. I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn the uh, uh, Planning and Development Committee. Uh, Director Point Jr. and Director Gettin second. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Chair Canodal. At this time, we have on the Scheduled Protective Services Committee, um, we do not have Superintendent Hunter here and his team. Um, CAO, are we able to go to the Christy Mountain report? If, if we start protective services? Uh, do we know if we have our presenter on the Christy Mountain report signed in? Let's have a look. Um, Danny, do you know? I'm not seeing. I know we have Sean Heisler on. Okay, or alternatively, CAO, we could. Um, move ahead to community services. I don't know, that's gonna to take too long, probably. Okay, well, let's see if we can get the presenter on the line for Christy Mountain Wildfire. Well, we could go to community services or corporate, uh, Madam Chair, those are just internal reports and we could uh, adjust our schedule when our presenters come online. Okay, so for community services, we have the rec update. So if we have Augusto available, um, yeah, it looks like he is. Okay, so what we're going to do, folks, we'll go to community services. So I'm going to turn things over to Chair Bauer for community services. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, looking for a motion to approve the agenda, please. Uh, uh, Director Holmes, second it. Director Bush, all in favor? Motion is carried. I don't think anybody was opposed. Uh, so regional recreation update, CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So our regional recreation program has been evolving over the last few years. Our community services department uh, as a whole uh, is fairly young. Uh, we uh, established it in 2010. 
Uh, it included protective services and mostly parks and trails. And then uh, as the interest in recreation grew, uh, we uh, brought on staff um, that was more attuned to promoting our recreation services throughout the region. And we've had a number of really good projects uh, over the last few years. And Augusta Romero is our uh, recreation manager right now. And Augusta has uh, promoted regional recreation. And uh, he has now developed a presentation for you on uh, sort of what was accomplished in 2020 and where the program is heading in 2021. So we'll turn that over to uh, Mr. Romero, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Romero. Just go right ahead. Thank you very much. And the presentation should be coming up here, but uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to present on regional recreation. My name is Augusto Romero and I'm the regional recreation manager. I have a number of slides to present today, so I'll do my best to keep things brief. At the end of my presentation, I will also be available for questions. Next slide, please. The intent of this report and presentation is to provide an overall update on regional recreation. This year's re recreation report includes an overview of recreation's mission and goal, outline of recreation's work, recreation's resources, highlights from and recommendations and learnings from 2020, and an outline of the work expected for 2021. Next slide, please. To start us off, I would like to share our mission, which helps guide our work in recreation. In addition to the RDUS corporate business plan, recreation's work is guided by several foundational documents, which include a framework for recreation in Canada from 2015, Plan H, Physical Literacy in Canada. In aligning with these guiding documents and RDUS's mission, we've established the following RDUS recreation mission. It is to increase the citizen's quality of life and the community's well-being through recreation opportunities while achieving social, economic, and environmental benefits. We know that recreation is critical in communities as a proactive and prevention aspect to health and crime, and additionally, as it relates to mental health. Recreation's role is not just from a program's perspective, but also through areas such as special events, there are positive impacts in the economy through tourism and employment. And potentially from the perspective of environment, there can be benefits as we explore opportunities related to active transportation. So ultimately what we believe to be recreation's outcome here is healthy individuals and communities. At this point, I'm using this mission and this outcome to help guide the regional recreation work. Next slide, please. So to achieve our mission and outcomes, recreation is tasked to provide recreation services throughout the regional district from a local and regional perspective. These services mainly include recreation programs, special events bookings, and in the Simokameen, a recreation center and pool. But as the definition of recreation is often so inclusive of many aspects of community well-being, recreation's work also includes the development of partnerships, management of volunteers, community studies, and liaising with our commissions. So on this slide, I've outlined the main buckets of work in blue and the administrative areas that span across those buckets of work in green. Next slide, please. Further to deliver on recreation's work, the recreation resource approach for program delivery is through a small core staff team to coordinate the delivery while contracting out instructors, leaders, specialists, and volunteers for the direct delivery portion. This approach to delivery of recreation services is established to be the most cost-effective, flexible, and efficient for us at this time. With a year like we had in 2020, this is absolutely proven to be a beneficial model as we continue to have the flexibility to scale programs down and up during this pandemic. As recreation within the RDS does not operate in isolation, there's often regular crossover with Similkameen Recreation and our parks and facilities. Next slide, please. So over the next two slides here, I will provide some of the recreation highlights from 2020, broken out within our key work areas. <clears throat> Overall in program and events, recreation needed to be creative and flexible in 2020. Under the circumstances from the year, the recreation team has been 
and continues to be a force and to be forced to do short-term plans around programs and events. As some of the stats here outline, recreation services, services were still delivered where we could and were permitted to. The team embraced the challenges and created regional virtual programs, new outdoor program pilots, a new way of and new ways for the public to remain connected and healthy. On the partnership side, we were able to explore new partnerships such as ones with Penticton and District Arts Council, City of Penticton, Naramata Center, LSCSS, Pacific Sport Okanagan, and the school district to name a few. What's important about these partnerships is we were able to leverage in some cases costs and funds, efforts, space, and or expertise. As an example, creation and distribution of art kits, staff sharing for summer programs. In addition, still within partnerships, we were able to update a number of agreements, one regarding the Sun Bowl Arena, uh, School District 53 Joint Use, and Interior Health Partnership Agreement. Next slide, please. Consistent in 2020, volunteers continue to be a critical asset for recreation and engaging the community from a program and special events perspective. Accounting for about 550 hours of service from 17 volunteers, we could roughly estimate this to an approximate value of about $10,000 worth of additional services across the region. In 2020, we were also able to focus on updating and formalizing our volunteer program. In the next slide, I would like to take the opportunity to share with you the volunteer video released in December. Lastly, on this slide, from a project perspective, Recreation was also leading the work associated with Regional Child Care Planning Project, West Bench Age Friendly Assessment and Plan, and as mentioned, the launch of the formal RDOS Volunteer Program. Additionally, RDOS Rec chairs the Physical Literacy for Communities Committee, or the PL4C, which includes multiple se sectors such as the School District, Interior Health, Okanagan College, sport, and a number of municipalities across the South Okanagan. Next slide, please. And this is the volunteer video released in December. Danny, do we have sound on this? We do have sound here. I'm not sure if others are hearing sound. I'm not hearing sound on my end here. This video can be found now on our website. We have a tab within employment and volunteers that links to our volunteer opportunities for the RDOS currently and is where we can also do future recruitment of volunteers for special events as well as programs. And if we can't get sound here, Danny, we can certainly move on and folks can also uh, find this video as part of our RUS YouTube channel as well. We'll try. No. The Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen, the RDOS, covers approximately 11,000 square kilometers. The Regional District is home to more than 80,000 people and includes nine electoral areas and six member municipalities. Residents and visitors can enjoy a variety of recreation programs and community events, as well as outstanding parklands and facilities. Building healthy and cohesive communities in the South Okanagan and Similkameen is an essential part of the programs and services offered by the RDOS, and a dedicated and diverse group of volunteers makes it all possible. 
I volunteer with the RVOS in a role of an emergency support services director because I like working with people and I enjoy helping the community in the event of a disaster. It makes me feel pretty good to volunteer with the RDOS. They made it a really simple process and I feel like I had a lot of organizational skills and I didn't mind being the liaison between some interested players and the RDOS, so it was a perfect fit. Well, it gives me a sense that I'm uh, accomplishing something worthwhile to uh, volunteer with the RDOS. I feel that should do something. The community has done things for me. Why shouldn't I do something for the community too? For me, volunteering with the RDOS, my community benefits by more events and activities being able to be held, and there is more ways for people to bond with each other and builds communication skills and just brings the community together. The RDOS offers a variety of inclusive volunteer opportunities, from emergency support services to parks and recreation. If you'd like to share your skills, support others, and make a difference in your community, contact the RDOS today to find a program or schedule that fits your lifestyle. Thank you, Danny. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> So overall, 2020, as with many folks, proved to be a challenging year. 2020 could be described as a non-conventional learning year with continued adjustments and short-term planning. With the, challenges came, with the challenges came opportunities for recreation staff. We were able to focus on many of the foundational and review efforts that often fall short in direct delivery work, to direct delivery work. There was an increased need to work even more regionally with partners and to expand our traditional thinking within recreation. This resulted in new pilot intro programs in areas like uh, swim safety, fishing, snowshoeing, and whittling. From a performance measure standpoint, unfortunately at this time, recreation has not solidified which performance measures are most critical to track and report on. As part of 2021 work, performance measures will be identified and reported consistently yearly so that improvements and trends can be better tracked. Next slide, please. So what's in store for 2021? For 2021, recreation will be keeping the following guiding principles, remain flexible, adaptable, and to continue to develop and establish foundational aspects of recreation services. Next slide, please. At this stage, we continue to work through some of the challenges of operating a front-facing service during a pandemic. We will need to continue to be flexible and adaptable in 2021 and manage the ongoing ch changes and maintain or expand programming where we have permission to, to do so. It seems as though the safe approach in programming continually remains in the area of children and youth, outdoor programs, and virtual. Next slide, please. What, we mean when, what do we mean when we say foundational aspects of recreation? It's really about how we do, how do we continue to be as effective, efficient, and accountable in the work we do. As an example, this requires us to establish and implement recreation business processes. One of the areas that I'm hoping to dip into from this perspective would be how we manage our special events and bookings. Additionally, we wanna to continue to work on how we market and communicate to the public as it relates to recreation. And lastly, from an accountability standpoint, we need to establish a baseline of accountability measures or performance measures. As my familiarity is with an approach called result-based accountability or RBA, I've decided to use this framework as a starting point and I'll speak to this more in slide 14. Next slide, please. From the perspective of projects for 2021, Recreation will be closing out two assessment plans from 2020, the West Bench Age Friendly and the Regional Child Care Project. For 2021, two new projects, will be initiated. Recreation will take a lead coordination role in the parks, facilities, and recreation master plan, and in updating the special events and booking process for the region. Lastly, RDOS Recreation will continue to move on the implementation of the volunteer program, which includes the monthly spotlight on a volunteer from the RDOS, which was recently featured on Castanet. We'll also work towards a vol the volunteer week in April, which will include a regional initiative, ongoing recruitment and management of our current volunteers, a variety of pop-up initiatives and special events throughout the region, and some form of recognition at the end of the year for our volunteers. 
Next slide, please. As mentioned in an earlier slide, for 2021, I've decided to apply a results-based accountability or RBA approach to performance measures. Without getting into great detail on what RBA is, the essence of it is that you start with the end result and see how to best work backwards and contribute to that outcome. Recreation's contribution will be monitored through performance measures outlined in this table. And what you'll notice is that we'll be tracking quantitative elements as well as, as, well as qualitative ones. This is often critical balance uh, in a service like recreation. My hope is that with some measures established, we can begin it, uh, looking at baselines and later at trends and gaps, ideally moving the needle forward for healthier individuals and communities. Next slide, please. So at this time, I wanna thank you again for this opportunity to present and through the chair, I'm avail available for any questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you Mr. Romero for the presentation. I think our delegation is uh, uh, here for the protective services. So uh, Mr. Newell, I see your hand. I'm thinking you were gonna say the same thing. Uh, well, I usually do, Mr. Chair, but in this case, I was just going to pile on uh, with regards to the regional recreation program uh, a little bit. From a strategic perspective, uh, we have always identified in our business plans that we're looking for economies of scale and partnerships and efficiencies, uh, looking more uh, as to how we can share resources. Uh, and recreation is one of those where uh, you really have to refer back to that indirect benefits principle where uh, not all of our citizens may be using our facilities, parks, or recreation programs, but we certainly benefit by having them available for our youth and uh, those that uh, do like to get out and socialize uh, through recreation and to uh, get healthier. So from a big picture point of view, uh, in our plan this year, uh, when we were discussing assumptions, uh, we were assuming that uh, those citizens in our rural areas are really now looking for urban services and recreation is one of those where we have an opportunity to grow uh, and expand and provide uh, that better quality of life in our uh, rural communities. And recreation doesn't happen overnight. It's one of those where you start and you nourish participants and then you can grow your programs uh, into uh, higher volume. So uh, I appreciate what, what Mr. Romero has done uh, with, from a regional perspective over the past few years. And uh, I just hope the board is starting to see some uh, benefit of that as we uh, move forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newell. I couldn't agree more. Chair Kosakovic, do we have time for questions or should we move into protective now? I think it would be fair to find out from the board if if they have a bunch of questions, we can recess this and come back to it. Uh, if they don't, we can certainly just adjourn out of uh, community services. Okay, thank you. So, uh, directors, any questions of Mr. Romero regarding this? Uh, Director Spencer? Yeah, I just one. I was wondering if we could get a copy of that presentation sent to us. Director Romero, uh, Director Mr. Romero, can we uh, get a copy to the board? Yes, absolutely. Uh, through the chair, we can certainly have that available. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Romero? Director Montes has one. Okay, sorry, Director Montes. Ah, yeah, down there. Yeah, to the chair. I encourage uh, Augusto to also give a very similar presentation to the commissions and engage them in the process because I feel that they are the representation for the community voice. And I feel like they, they need to be a little more informed than they've been currently getting. Okay, good comment. Uh, any other questions or comments from any directors? I could just add, uh, Chair Bauer, that uh, that's a great suggestion. And if uh, our upcoming Parks and Rec Commission meetings could have uh, Mr. Romero attend and, and maybe we could distribute this presentation ahead of time to them and then find out what questions or suggestions they have as we move forward. So thank you for that, Director Monti. Okay. Any other questions or comments? 
A direct motif is a hand up. I'm not sure if it's left over. Yeah, okay. Okay, final time. Don't see anything, so a motion to adjourn, please. Director Cohen, thank you. The committee service is, uh, is adjourned. Moving on. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chair <clears throat> Bauer. We're going to move on to Protective Services Committee meeting, and I'm going to turn things over to Chair Roberts. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and just in case I've been having connectivity issues, um, I have um, Director um, Spence, uh, Spencer Coyne who will um, take over if all of a sudden I lose everybody because it's happened a couple times. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the agenda of the uh, Protective Services Committee? I see Director Bauer and I see uh, Director Watt. Everybody, anybody, everybody else in favor? All in favor? Anyone opposed? Seeing none, we'll carry on and we will refer over to the CAO uh, in regards to the delegates. Delegation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I see our RCMP delegation is out in force this morning uh, uh, around the board table. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we always enjoy these, and I know that uh, Superintendent Hunter uh, will have uh, 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 lots of time for questions at the end, but uh, as always, uh, we appreciate going through the mayor's report. Uh, an old term that doesn't really fit with uh, regional districts, but nevertheless, uh, everybody knows what I'm referring to uh, uh, as the mayor's report. I think it did go out uh, with the agenda or uh, separately. But with that, Mr. Chair, we'll turn it over to Superintendent Hunter and he can uh, introduce his crew. Uh, good morning uh, to the board and, and through to the chair. Thanks for having us uh, here today. Uh, I think what we'll do is I'll go and touch on some salient points in relation to uh, Penticton and Penticton rule. And then we'll go around uh, the board. Sergeant Hughes is here, uh, commander in uh, Princeton. We have uh, Corporal Brian Evans, commander at Carameas. Uh, Sergeant Don Rigglesworth, new to our team here, Commander at Oliver. Uh, we have Corporal Dave Smith, who's representing Asoyus this morning. Uh, uh, Jason Beta can't make it here today. And of course, we have Sergeant Dave Preston uh, from Summerland Detachment. So we will uh, go in, in that order. Um, for Penticton, I'm not going to go through all of the numbers, and, and many on the call here have uh, um, knowledge of my uh, council meeting uh, in Penticton. There's been some uh, some media surrounding that and uh, some, some good discussions that have been happening. Uh, in, in the uh, rural area, uh, I will say uh, there's no uh, anomalies in the quarterly report and uh, year to date, uh, you know, bicycle thefts uh, are, are up uh, from 15 to 26. And uh, that's not a surprise, uh, given uh, the nature of some of the criminal activity in, in our community. And uh, I'll be pushing this year, uh, I think I've stated it before, Garage 529 and registering bicycles, uh, getting them in a system where uh, we retrieve uh, quite a few bikes out there, but we don't have uh, either the serial number was never memorized or documented by the owner. We have no way of finding the owner. So that's something that we need to work on. Uh, Frauds are, are up both in the rural area and in the city of Penticton. And the majority of the increase in those frauds are related to the theft from vehicles and thefts uh, in relation to credit cards. There's been mail thefts and checks, and that's what those uh, frauds uh, are in uh, relation to. Real quickly, the Penticton detachment, uh, we launched our uh, the beginnings of our prolific offender management program in January. Uh, and uh, there's a, a front end uh, workload involved with that program, partnering uh, with uh, probation, Crown Council, uh, various of our uh, partner agencies in the community to identify our prolific offenders. It's a matter of, uh, we actually serve documentation on our prolific offenders. And uh, the whole idea is the, the very small percentage of our criminals are creating a lot of the havoc in our community. So I'm very excited about that. It's going to give our judiciary the opportunity to have a more fulsome uh, court package when we have these clients uh, before a judge, either for remand or sentencing. So I'm very excited about that. 
Uh, we continue to work very well with Interior Health, assisting us with uh, responding to those calls for service of people in crisis, uh, be it uh, suicidal, homicidal, or just, just a really, really bad environment that they're in. Uh, it's it's uh, generally not a police matter, it's, it's a medical crisis, and uh, partnering with uh, Interior Health will be uh, uh, enhance their safety and the safety of our members, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some numbers, given that it's the year end and just on the 25th of January, uh, the BC government uh, published their BC police resources uh, document. Uh, it's for 2019, they're always a year behind, but it's the most recent stats that we have in relation to uh, uh, crime rates and, and the caseload of our police officers indicating just how busy a particular detachment is. So you're more than welcome to grab a pen and write some numbers down. I will email these numbers and a link to that report uh, to, uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll send it to Carla and she can get it out to, to the rest of the board to have a look at that. Um, so what happens in these numbers? There's three categories of uh, within the RCMP policing jurisdictions in the province. There's municipal policing of communities over the population of 15,000. Certainly, uh, Penticton fits into that. There's municipal policing of communities between five and 15,000, and certainly uh, Summerland has that, and Asoyas has a component of that. And then we have uh, rural policing jurisdictions, uh, and uh, uh, those are our uh, provincial resources. Uh, so real quickly, of the municipal over, over 15,000, uh, I can tell you that the uh, provincial average for the members caseload there is 71. Uh, Penticton detachment is at 170, which is 139% higher than the average. I'm not going to get into uh, extreme detail on that. I've done that already, but just for the entire board's awareness, uh, very, very, very busy at the detachment. Uh, and uh, it doesn't allow a lot of time for our members to do that proactive work out there. And quite candidly, some calls uh, we just can't tend to on those busy shifts. Uh, the crime rate uh, average for uh, large municipalities is uh, the average is 95 and Penticton's is at 219, uh, which is 131% uh, higher. Uh, that, uh, that's, uh, and I've quoted and I'll say it here, that's an egregious crime rate that uh, uh, we need to work as a community uh, to, uh, to work on that. I can tell you the... Um, provincial policing jurisdictions and i'm going to go through that right now and penticton has a provincial component to it the only one that doesn't is summerland detachment so uh the provincial uh there's 119 provincial jurisdictions policed by the rcmp and the uh the crime the average crime rate in our provincial policing jurisdictions is uh, 77 and uh penticton our crime rate in the rural area is 76 we're on par where we're not on par is the caseload. So the provincial average for those 119 jurisdictions, caseload per officer is 68, and Penticton provincial is at 137, which is 101% of the provincial average. And of the 119 uh, provincial areas, Penticton provincial is number four. So it's not just the municipality, it's our provincial policing areas at Penticton, the crime rate is average, but we just do not have the proper number of uh, police resources to deal with those calls for service. Uh, Oliver detachment, so the crime rate average is 77. Oliver has a high crime rate at 114, uh, which is 48% higher uh, than the provincial average. And as well, they have a high caseload. Um, the provincial average at 68, Oliver's is at 117 which is 72% higher. Uh, Princeton Detachment, their crime rate is at 99, uh, which is 29% higher than the provincial average, and their caseload is at 77, 13% uh, higher than the case uh, provincial caseload. Karameas, uh, their crime rate is at 68, uh, which is 12% less than the provincial average, and their caseload is at 59, which is 13% uh, less. Uh, Soyuz, this is their provincial component. 
Uh, their crime rate is 84, uh, which is 9% higher than the, the, the provincial average. And their caseload is at uh, 55, which is 19% uh, less. I know there's lots of numbers. I'm going to email them out after uh, the meeting. And the last, we do have two uh, municipalities between five and 15,000. So their average crime rate in the province uh, is 108. The Soyuz Municipal is at 74 which is 31% lower than the provincial average. Uh, the caseload for five to 15,000 municipalities is 80. The average is 80. Uh, Asoyas is at 68, which is 15% less. And for Summerland, uh, their crime rate is 57, which is 47% less than the provincial average. And their caseload is 78, which is 3% less than the provincial average. I know it's I got to reiterate, I'll email them out to you and, and by all means, give me a call. We'll have a discussion. What do you think about those numbers? So I will say this, um, it is my job to lobby and provide business cases to the provincial government to provide more policing resources where they're needed on the provincial side of the house. I certainly welcome lobbying and comments from our elected officials and communities that they need more police officers. I always welcome that. I will tell you, I, I do have a business case for both rural Penticton and Oliver for additional policing resources uh, to be provided by the BC government. Uh, the numbers speak for themselves. And with that, the Southeast District Commander has uh, endorsed those business cases and has presented them to our uh, uh, criminal operations officer at E Division who will approach the provincial government. As you know, last year, uh, the detachment did the same and we did get an extra provincial resource for both Penticton and Oliver. So we're hoping uh, the same uh, again this year. Uh, that's it for me. Um, I'm wondering, and it's up to the board, if we want to go around to all of the detachments, we'll say our thing, and then maybe questions and answers for all of us afterwards. Does that work for everyone? Sure. Thank you, Superintendent uh, Hunter. That sounds good. Okay, perfect. So I'll pass it on to uh, Sergeant Rob Hughes now to talk about Princeton and just the what's going on in Princeton and those types of things. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for having us. Um, the quarterly numbers of Princeton, every, everything lo looks pretty good. The one thing that concerned me when I looked at these numbers was the uh, year to date for sexual offenses. So, made a couple of phone calls and did, did a, a bunch of queries. Uh, the first thing that kind of came to light was uh, like the, on the online sexual offenses are, are contribute to most of this increase over the year. And the information that I was given that seems, seems to be accurate is that we're getting better in detecting the online stuff and people are being getting more comfortable with reporting it. So I don't know, I don't think yearly that we're actually, there's more offenses. I think there's just more, people are getting better at reporting it and we're getting better at detecting it. So bringing that back to the quarter stats, uh, going from one to two, one of those was a historic event from reported uh, from 2018. So that number is, is in line. But the perfect number is zero, of course, for, for any sexual offenses. But Could you say then what online means? So the, like online with child, child pornography, uh, for the most part of it, we have um, of the 14 for year to date, uh, one was actually scored incorrectly. There was a, there was a component of it that was possibly um, sexual offense related, but we've since removed that. So of the 13, uh, most of these People sending pictures back and forth by Instagram. Uh, we're getting notified now, like Facebook, those uh, entities are notifying us. Uh, mostly comes through uh, ICE, which is the Integrated Child Exploitation Unit out of uh, E-Division. So they do the preliminary investigation and then determine through IP addresses where it's coming from and then forward it to whatever agency is uh, in their jurisdiction. So that's, that's the online component uh, and as well. We've got a few of these that are um, teenagers sending pictures of themselves to other teenagers, and that's that gets flagged, and we get notified by that. So we're getting better at detecting those those things and shutting it down before it uh, gets out of hand. And our property, all our property crime numbers are down. Are down. Um, frauds, I guess the uh, the criminals need to make money somehow. Our frauds are up up a little bit uh, from six to nine, 
And most of those, I, I looked into those, most of those are the online scams where people are falling for the, you know, there's a warrant out for your ass and press one and follow, follow through and give us your credit card information to stop to pay your fee so you don't, you don't get arrested. And that's unfortunately and, and sad that uh, that's mostly the, the elderly community that are falling for that. So we, we get uh, we get those in incredibly hard to investigate and find out where they're coming from. It's all done, done over the internet. So. Uh, the only other thing that we have going on um, is, and Director Roberts is aware, is aware of this, I think you probably are part, part of uh, the launch of this, in dealing with Andrew Reeder from REOS, uh, Director Roberts, and Kylie O'Dell from Modi about a uh, community cleanup in Headley. Um, that's just in the, we had a meeting, a phone conference meeting this week. Um, in, the, in the early stages of that, everybody's going to try and work, work together and community consultation is going to go and see if the community actually wants that before we go ahead with that. And that's about all I've got for Princeton. Things are running pretty smooth right now. Thanks for that, Rob. And we'll go over to uh, Corporal Brian Evans, uh, Karamias. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, having us here today. I'm here to present for the Karamias quarter four stats for 2020. Um, very much like uh, Princeton uh, spoke to, we have some of the categories that are, are, are up uh, as well. So we have so sex offenses have been increased uh, from three reported, uh, or so from one to three for the quarter. So those are actually looked into those, those are historical reports that have come in. So those are offenses that uh, occurred years ago and were reported to us. So they get uh, included on this quarter as far as uh, the sex offenses go. Um, generally speaking on the property crime side of the house, we're, we're down um, significantly across the board, except for two categories. One being a break and enter into businesses. So those took a look at those files. Those were related to either fruit stands or, or stole or a theft from a, um, one of the mechanic shops in town had some scrap metal stolen. So nothing uh, majorly concerning. They're not, uh, but um, in relation to those, they, they're always a concern, any offense is, but uh, they're not, uh, it's not an organized crime or anything. It seems to be a bit more of, um, easy targets that people are trying to pick on there. And in risk to the frauds, um, just as Sergeant Hughes said, <clears throat> our numbers are coming from the telephone fraud. So people receiving those, everyone get, everyone I'm sure has received those calls that from, uh, you know, Service Canada and enforcement officers. So those, uh, those are the calls that have increased our fraud numbers for this quarter. Um, overall, we've, we've seen a decrease of 14% uh, in criminal code files for the, for the last, uh, compared to last year's quarter. So um, that's positive. Um, otherwise, all is well um, in uh, Karamea, so I don't have any, any major concerns to report. Thank you, Brian. We'll move on to uh, Sergeant Don uh, Rigglesworth, the new commander in Oliver. I understand that they're going really well there. It's always a very exciting opportunity for a new commander to join a community and, and start developing those relationships and networking both internally with the members and externally in the community. And, and, and I am hearing some great things. So Don, if you just want to share what's happening in Oliver, that'd be great. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, two months in and I'll call it the honeymoon phase right now because things uh, seem to be going well in the right direction. Uh, getting to know uh, my people and them getting to know me. Uh, I've met uh, with Mary Johansson a few times. We have our secret coffee hot chocolate meeting area at a social distance and we have gone over our the stats that have been presented by Superintendent Hunter. Um, a couple uh, concerning issues seem to be presenting themselves from the last quarter compared to 2019 uh, with sexual offenses from two to four. Uh, again, repeating what Sergeant Hughes was saying, uh, a couple of those are online reported to us from the Integrated Child Exploitation Unit with child pornography and they're being investigated locally by our officers. Also, the uh, domestic violent trend, I don't want to explain it and get into it or, or look into it further, but there has been coverage across the country talking about increased trends in domestic violence, perhaps with 
people spend a little bit too much time in these close quarters together. We looked at a lot of other things that are going down. On the other side of that, residential break and enters, it was good to see it was at zero. People being home, business break and enters are down. Uh, there was a high profile one uh, just right at the end of December that was all over Facebook, uh, industrial uh, business, uh, Munchkoff uh, Enterprises. It was a quick uh, cutting of a fence. They back a truck up and stole a $10,000, $20,000 flatbed trailer and were gone. I think it was under two minutes. We were actively investigating. We had assistance from uh, district investigators. These were organized people, not from our area. Um, Southeast District Media uh, will be coming out with this <coughs> of how this has progressed. But that trailer was recovered uh, two days ago. Uh, it was being towed by a stolen pickup truck. It had driven from Armstrong to Kelowna. It was in the process of loading up a $50,000 piece of equipment when the individuals were arrested. And it's an ongoing huge investigation that we, our small part of it was returning a trailer to the owners that were quite happy. I think it was the second time it was stolen. Um, speaking with uh, Mary Johansson, uh, he's interested in looking further into CAST, community active support table. I have been researching it myself and I sat in on a meeting yesterday just to observe and review look at the resources and how they go about identifying individuals where uh, different aspects of the community support can come together and see what they can do for these people. So that's a work in progress for me. Um, we've also been discussing the hot button, hot topic issue of uh, a shelter coming to all of them. And Mary Johansson was picking my brain on my experiences here in Penticton what my viewpoints were that I presented to council back in 2014, 2015, um, and that what we're seeing um, has developed since. I'm a strong supporter of supportive housing, and we're working towards that. Um, and again, I'm just a small piece of the puzzle that has some opinions, and I'm happy to share them, uh, but not right now. Um, other than that, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the direction we're going, and uh, looking forward to uh, positive stint in all over here. Well, well, thank you, Don. Uh, great presentation. And uh, we'll go to uh, Dave. All things as soyous. How's things going over there, Dave? Actually, over well. Things are going very well. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Mayor McCordoff and uh, Director Pendergraft. Um, just looking at some of the numbers here, uh, uh, like uh, Sergeant Brigglesworth said, with domestic violence, we've seen an uptick in that as well. But I would just warn looking at the numbers, I would say last year that for that period was unusually low for uh, the numbers. So of course, anything higher than that's gonna appear as a large percentage increase. Uh, like Don said, I think a lot of that, uh, our members have been attending some of these situations that people have come right out and said, we've just been spending too much time together, maybe, maybe dipping into the, the alcohol and whatnot a little more than they normally would. So, um, there seem to be some reasonable explanations as to as to that increase. Uh, we'll talk about auto theft as well. Uh, a bit of an uptick there. Uh, the trend we're seeing right now, uh, and Don sort of touched on it as well, is that some of these people aren't our own local people that are doing this. A lot of it is uh, traveling criminals, as best we can tell, as evidenced by we'll have a vehicle stolen in a Soyuz and it'll show up, uh, for example, in Hope or somewhere like that, or Kelowna, and vice versa. And uh, those are the ones that are a little bit more difficult to, to track, of course, are these people who don't really have any link to your community and they're just passing through committing crime and then off to the bigger centers. Um, and part of that as well, part of the auto theft is, is education. We're still working on educating the community. There is a component that still thinks, you know, small town of Soyuz, we don't need to lock our vehicle doors and whatnot. I had a case last week where brand new uh, Dodge Ram pickup uh, left it unlocked in their driveway with the spare key and key fob under the driver's seat mat, under the driver's uh, mat. Uh, the way the vehicle was, they weren't able to steal it that night, but uh, you can bet they'd be coming back for a new truck. So people just have to be a little more cognizant about, about securing those items. We'll talk as well about uh, break and enter uh, up. 
break and enter other specifically, which is anything other than a dwelling house. Uh, the vast majority of those uh, have occurred in our rural area out in the anarchist uh, Bridesville area. And uh, we have a very good handle on who is responsible for those. And uh, they're currently under charge right now and a curfew and everything else. Uh, the difficulty is um, trying to keep these people in, in custody sometimes <clears throat> at our best efforts. Uh, you, may re you may remember uh, from back in December, uh, there was quite a high profile uh, chase that was uh, involved the Soyuz members and Midway members of a prolific uh, property offender out in the Bridesville area, uh, which resulted in them basically a long foot chase and them getting stuck and two flight crews being called out of Comox search and rescue to rescue them and the member out of the position they were in. Uh, and that is one of these individuals who we believe is responsible for the majority of these. They've sort of, they sort of found our Achilles heel, if you will, in terms of our hours of operation and also uh, the rural, very rural nature of where they've chosen to set up shop, which is essentially on the border between us and uh, Midway Detachments area. Uh, just sort of minimizing the chance of them coming across police doing random patrols. Um, but again, we are working, uh, we're even working with uh, the property owner who's from out of province uh, regarding the property where these people have basically been, been staying in undeveloped property. So we are working on it. They are under charge. And uh, we have noticed in the last few weeks with the extra attention we've been giving them that uh, we have noticed a decrease in activity in that area. And besides that, uh, fraud is up uh, a little bit as well. And uh, a lot of that is the phone component. Uh, a lot of the, the, the scams people calling in and we do have an older population in a Soyuz and it seems to be some of the older people who are falling prey to these people a little easier and uh, um, and following the direction that they're given when these people get them on the phone. But aside from that, the Soyuz continues to be a very, very good place to work and, and live and uh, no major concerns. Thank you, Dave. Uh, appreciate that. And moving on to uh, uh, Summerland, uh, Sergeant Preston. Thank you. Once once again, we saving the best for last. But I think <laughs> Summerland, and you just probably, sit there. Probably on next time I'll be going uh, first next. But um, Summerland, Court Four, total calls for service have been uh, you know sitting pretty steady. It was six hundred five calls for service. Uh, a little mi minor decrease, uh, eight percent. Uh, but pretty much year to date is uh, staying steady uh, with the numbers. Uh, there was a positive shift um, with our majority of the crime types, uh, a shift in the right direction, uh, a decrease in the, in the numbers pretty much around the, the board. Uh, with the exception of uh, uttering threats, uh, we went from eight files to nine, uh, so that caused a 13% uh, increase. Uh, and then also theft from vehicles, just a minor 5% uh, increase, which was uh, 21 uh, to 22, uh, those files. Um, another note that I looked at was uh, B&E to businesses, which overall year to date was, was down, uh, or sorry, an increase uh, by 77%. I think it's worth noting, I think it was in the media yesterday that ETM um, arrests were done in Summerland was of course uh, and many of the communities I believe were, were impacted by that uh, uh, but uh, they, they did uh, do search warrants uh, and made the arrests uh, with that and several items were stolen items were retrieved so um, that, that's a good thing um, <clears throat> traffic incidents still be still our number one calls for uh, service in Summerland uh, this quarter had 80. Uh, we do have a traffic initiative that we have uh, implemented. Uh, just for in the, in the just for an example, we've uh, in the quarter Q4, uh, our summer, Summerland members uh, issued uh, or had 204 contacts, and that's whether it's traffic tickets or warnings or uh, impaired drivers or prohibited drivers, so just uh, traffic stops and and contacts. So. Um, we also have the South Okanagan Traffic Services that help us out there, and they've uh, for Summerland they, they did an additional 110 
uh, contacts within our community. Uh, South Okanagan Traffic Services, that, they changed their name, correct? BC, Highway, it's Patrol, BC no. Highway Patrol. Uh, page two. Uh, so being quarter four, I was I just kind of just did a rough little um, assessment on our 2018, 2019, 2020 stats. Uh, just some key uh, information that kind of stood out to me was 2020, we had an increase of, uh, well, we went from 139 report to Crown Councils. So that's court charges that have gone through to uh, Crown uh, versus 28 the year before. Uh, so pretty significant uh, increase, but I mean, 2019 was a lower than average number, but 2020, we definitely saw an increase. Uh, there's also a, you know, a number of uh, increase in those traffic stops and, and uh, that we did see there. And, and then the other significant thing that I noted was uh, uh, motor vehicle injuries went down from 23 in 2019 to only nine in 2020. So um, obviously I believe you know, COVID had something to do with that, uh, not as much traffic and, and all that. Um, but I think that's all I have. Uh, Thanks, Dave. And, and before we open it up uh, to questions, I just want to share with the board, um, Sergeant Brigglesworth touched on it, Sergeant Preston touched on it. So I'm going to talk about some integrated efforts that we do in, in the Okanagan here. Uh, so uh, several months ago, we identified a crime group uh, links to Alberta, Vernon, Kamloops, uh, Kelowna, Penticton, Summerland, uh, Oliver, uh, definitely okay falls Caledon area so what we did as uh, officers in charge of our detachments myself Kelowna Vernon and Kamloops we committed as a team to uh, contribute resources to a large team that were dedicated to this crime group uh, which involved uh, surveillance crime analysts uh, lots of search warrants we also have members within our detachment uh, doing surveillance uh, following vehicles around and what it culminated into was uh, as uh, Sergeant Brigglesworth described uh, we were able to catch them in the act with a lot of stolen property stealing some more property um, dozens and dozens of, of warrants and charges so it, it was a big project uh, and that just goes to show there's no there's no boundaries regarding detachments and jurisdictions with these prolifics and uh, very proud of the entire Okanagan uh, police force uh, getting together and, and working collaboratively with each other uh, in, in attacking these uh, criminals. It's, it's just a, a fantastic example of uh, us working together and, and we need to do, uh, continue to do that in, in, in the entire region, not just uh, Penticton South Okanagan, the entire Okanagan. It's just, it's just a great example. So uh, over to the chair. Thank you, um, uh, Superintendent Hunter, and to all the commanders. I uh, really appreciate um, what you've been talking about. And I, too, not wanting to consider myself a senior citizen, but nearly got taken by a telefraud uh, the other night, and they're getting pretty darn pretty fancy. It was pretty impressive, but uh, I did hang up. Um, I may have issues. I'm going in and out. I'll be asking for Chair Kozakovich's support and making sure I can see if anybody's hands are up for any of the questions. So anyway, if we can open it up, if any of the directors have uh, questions to any of the specific uh, commanders and or to uh, Superintendent Hunter. Okay, Chair Roberts, you have a question from Director Knodal and Director Bob Coyne. Okay, well, well, I saw uh, Director Coyne first, so if we can pass on to, to him. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't a question. It's more of a, a uh, thank you to Superintendent. I watched him on TV last night, and um, I really want to thank him for his statement about how so much of our petty crime, our homelessness, um, and things like that are a direct result of uh, mental illness. This is something that we can't legislate, the, the government can't legislate people to not be mentally ill. And uh, it is really nice to see, especially with all of the media coverage in the past year of 
RCMP or police in general having issues doing these calls to check up on mentally ill people. And it is just a real great thing what he did last night to um, put it put it out there that that our RCMP are working hand in hand to try and work through this issue. It's it's a it's never going to go away, and we need a different attitude in society to deal with these things. Thank you. Thank you, Director Coyne. Could uh, Director Canodal has a question? Uh, I echo uh, Director uh, Coyne's thoughts, and I'd like to thank Superintendent Hunter and all the detachment heads for their fine work. Uh, the police have been under attack, it seems, in the last few years, but uh, what I'm sure my all, all the other directors and myself have seen is that uh, the South Okanagan detachments adhere uh, very well to the appeals principles of policing. They're a force truly to be proud of, uh, and to that end, we'll carry on. My big concern right now is what is possibly just a perceived uh, 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 vision of uh, increasing violence in our, our crime. Uh, you know, witness the uh, report of the uh, sawed-off shotgun and the police apprehension in Penticton here. That concerns me greatly. It, it, it may be uh, media hype, but it, it's something that puts not all your members in, in uh, uh, serious positions, but it also it, it could affect, it will affect the uh, citizens soon. So I, I'm becoming quite concerned about that and wondering if you have uh, uh, programs uh, being developed to, to, to kind of uh, stay on top of that uh, particular issue. Uh, my other uh, piece is uh, Sergeant Wigglesworth. I haven't met you yet. You are in my area, uh, and I'm sure you, you'll have the pleasure of meeting me soon enough in uh, the uh, committee meetings. And there's a couple of things that we'll have to. I see Judy laughing there. <laughs> but uh, we have a, a, a couple of things that I'd like to speak to you about on the uh, rural policing in this area. Some of our farmers are. Uh, are literally just targets uh, with so much equipment left in the uh, the rural areas and the pass-throughs. Uh, I think take good advantage of the heavy equipment. It's generally not so much the uh, the 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 Joe uh, attic that's doing it. It's it's the pros more than anything. This equipment isn't that easy to get rid of. So I'm sure we will will talk in the near future on that. Thank you very much. And thank you. I'll respond uh, through to the chair on, on the violence uh, issue. It, it's of a great concern uh, to uh, our members. I will tell you, most, most of the violence that uh, we experience in the community, uh, these aren't random acts of violence. Uh, they're known to each other. Uh, the concern, the big concern is uh, uh, the uh, complete disregard and disrespect for uh, authority uh, with a certain uh, sector of our society right now, that criminal element, they do not care. They do not care if they hurt the police. We have on average, uh, at least uh, once a, a shift, uh, I haven't done the complete stats, but I'll go with that, of uh, when we even try to pull over a vehicle, they just take off and, and drive erratically and uh, have no care for uh, life uh, with us trying to apprehend them. That case the other day with the loaded sawed off shotgun was the same. Ran into the police car, hurt one of our members. We had a case a month a bit ago where uh, same thing, we boxed somebody and then they did run over our member. That member uh, is still off. Uh, and it's just that attitude and complete disregard for the police and I can tell you some of the narrative directed toward the police over the last year is unwarranted and it feeds that attitude and it's very, very frustrating and becoming dangerous for us. So I do agree with that. We're aware of it, but we need a societal shift in attitude towards enforcement and taking care of business in our community and support for the police. Thank you, sir. Attendant uh, Hunter, we really appreciate what you had to say, and uh, I believe from all of us, we uh, we support you. And uh, when and if there's anything that we can do to uh, pass that message on, I'm, I'm certain each one of us would well like to. Uh, the next uh, person I see the question is uh, Director uh, Vazalaki. Thank you very. Um, yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Superintendent Hunter, can you please let the board know exactly how concerned you are with the wellness of your officers and um, the what do you think is the main reason for all the crime that we have in the city of Penticton in the areas that this crime is taking uh, place in? Uh, certainly, and, and uh, to the chair, the issue we have, and, and we talked, and, and I'm talking Penticton specific, but other detachments are not immune to this, uh, is just the sheer caseload that our members in Penticton, and, and as I described, it's not just the municipality, uh, it's the rural area. The crime rate in the rural area is, is average for uh, the province, but we don't have enough resources to deal with it. So the problem we have is um, our members are getting burned out. Uh, they're stressed. They're very frustrated in that they signed up to be police officers to kick butt out there, uh, solve crimes, and uh, a, a deep commitment to the community to do their job. And... Uh, uh, no pun intended, they're handcuffed in that. We have certain shifts, uh, especially when we get closer to the summer months here, where we just do not have the resources to respond to all of our calls for service. And, and some of them we don't respond to. We get in touch with the complainant, let them know how busy we are and follow up as best as we can. Just imagine here for a moment, uh, uh, a busy summer day shift in Penticton where we get 95s and we have five police officers responding to that. And if you can imagine, it all it takes is one file that could occupy five police officers alone dealing with a violent incident, and we're at the hospital with people, we're taking statements, and these files just keep backing up and backing up and backing up. A police officer goes back to their police car, there's 25 files in the queue waiting to be dispatched, and they don't even have the time to work on the current one uh, they're at. That's not every shift. I want everyone to appreciate that but they happen. That causes burnout. And uh, my commitment to every single police officer in the, the region that uh, I am in charge of here, their mental wellness is not gonna be compromised on the backs of us being under-resourced. We can only do what we can do. We're humans and we just can't respond to some of those calls for service. Uh, I will do everything in my power to maintain the wellness of our officers. And if that means we can't respond to all the calls, we're just not going to do it. It comes with a story. The city of Penticton has been great. Uh, the, you know, these times of austerity and pandemic and, and budget constraints, uh, they approved two officers uh, in this budget going around. I'm confident, and I'm not lobbying here, but I'm confident next, bu next uh, budget go around, we'll get some more members. I'm hopeful the province will, so we, we can get a hold of this uh, crime in the community. I'm really hoping uh, that uh, a lot of money gets invested in treatment and rehabilitation. That's the, the primary cause in Penticton. It's not all the cause. We have some prolific offenders here that we're gonna deal with, but uh, it's those addictions. These people are sick. They're suffering, and I say suffering hard. They need help. I have personally walked through uh, our shelters. I walked through last week uh, Victory Church, and those establishments are doing what they can to have a, a roof over the head of our vulnerable clients, but these folks are suffering and need some help. So it's a very complex issue in our community. Uh, we're only going to get through it as a community and, and help these folks out. But uh, the overburdened caseload of our members, uh, I'm, I'm going to be protecting our members so they don't burn out and support them. And I know I have community support, and I know I have uh, everyone on this call. I know I, I have your support as well, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Superintendent Hunter. I see that we have Director uh, Trainer. question. Hi, my comment is for Superintendent Hunter with regards to what you said about, <coughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, with yeah. Um, increased violence and, and negative attitudes towards the RCMP. Um, these are just my observations, but I, I know the RCMP, um, they have completely full plates in each community, but I think community outreach goes a long way. And, um, you know, your officers spend so much time dealing with really challenging people and crimes. Um, but I think there are a lot of people in our community who really value what you do. And um, I used to see that when I used to manage a Penticton farmer's market, I did that for five years. And um, every so often the, 
Penticton RCMP would do walk through the markets. And I know people really appreciated that and the kids like going up and, you know, taking photos with the RCMP. And so that kind of outreach, I think, um, builds a lot of community support. And it also um, makes the officers feel better and remind them that there is a lot of community support for them and people really do appreciate what they do. So um, I'm just wondering um, what kind of community outreach or um, presence the RCMP is having um, at events in the Okanagan to, um, to try to build that, that positive attitude, um, not only for the people in our community, but also for the officers themselves and, and just to remind them that they are appreciated. Uh, and thank you, and to the chair, I really appreciate those comments. And uh, we all know in this room, and all the police officers know, we have majority support in the community. Um, I, I'm going to suggest over 90%. So my comments about that attitude towards the police is those criminals, criminal, criminal mindset has changed a lot in the last five years. Uh, so there, there used to be an agreed upon respect for the most part, but that is completely gone. And, uh, and I'm referring to those criminals out there. They don't care and they're willing to hurt people to avoid apprehension. So that comment is not directed toward uh, the general population because I know we have support. Um, I, I, I know I can speak for our area detachment commanders. They're integrated in, in their communities. I know that for a fact. Uh, we are too in Penticton as and when we can. I, uh, I myself like to do foot patrols in the downtown core, uh, time permitting to uh, interact uh, with our, our clients out there. And yeah, it's a matter of spending some overtime dollars, which is very well worth it in Penticton for those uh, extra foot patrols, the bike patrols, uh, especially uh, when we get our uh, events back online, uh, when the pandemic is over, uh, to interact with those uh, clients. I can tell you police officers love that. It's just a matter of uh, getting that time, and, and that time is only afforded when uh, we do some uh, overtime shifts in, in that regard. I agree with you, it, it goes a long way, but I will tell you this, um, it, 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 it does not affect those that, that, uh, that core element of criminals. Um, uh, that we're, we're dealing with uh, right now. I, I really appreciate the positive comments though. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. So I see one uh, other question from uh, Director Canodal and just uh, everybody to remember that we have another delegation coming as well. So uh, if there's any more questions. So uh, Director Canodal, please. Once again, on the, on the violence issue and it's uh, uh, you know, we hear it every day, we see it in the news, and uh, it, it is uh, becoming apparent that uh, criminals, we're, we're hearing a lot more where they're willing to confront in the commission of crime, not only the police, but uh, but the, uh, the residents. So it's, uh, this fear is becoming quite real. I'm uh, just wondering whether, you, uh, and I don't want to put you on a spot, but uh, it, it seems that uh, some of this is being caused by um, a lack of consequence for uh, uh, violent bad behavior and whether a, a citizens action committee is directed at the uh, uh, minister of justice would uh, possibly uh, uh, help in that matter i'm just looking for your opinion on that uh, but I, I don't want to hang you out dry with the the federal masters either um, if you would please sir yeah, and thank you through to the chair. I, I'm not ever uh, afraid of being hung out to dry. I, uh, I'm very transparent and I think I'm a realist and pragmatic about uh, um, the criminal activity approach and, and the whole process. I will say this, um, the police have a job to do and we do it very, very, very well. We present the facts to the judiciary and uh, uh, they have a precedence and a standard that they have to deal with, and, and it's not for me to comment on that uh, precedence. I, I can tell you right now, every single police officer in the country, uh, we would love to see particular results with some of the people that we arrest. That doesn't always happen with our current system. Uh, that can be frustrating. We're talking about recidivism, where uh, those repeat offenders are, are, are out on bail conditions for a myriad of previous crimes and they continue to, to commit crimes uh, which can be very, very frustrating. We could go on for hours about uh, different directions uh, within our, our province and uh, through the Solicitor General and uh, the, the various mandates out there and then the effect of COVID uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a balance out there somewhere and I, I'm not going to comment whether we're at that balance. 
uh, but uh, certainly a, the, the recidivism and repeat offenders and seemingly at times uh, are not held to account uh, certainly are frustrating. I can tell you when we have a, a, a criminal that uh, has complete disregard and almost kills a police officer, you can well imagine what we would like to, to happen to them uh, in regards to incarceration. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Uh, next question I see is up for direct, from Director Gettins. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, through the Chair, I'm just curious about when you say that crime rate in rural areas are average, but we still don't have enough resources to deal with that, and you're putting forward a business case to try and get more resources, then you've got the support of the district commander. I think everywhere around this table would lend that support as well about getting more resources, but I'm wondering if it's time to also advocate how that formula between the provincial and federal government determines what is adequate resources. If your cases are more complex because of mental health and because of other layers that, you know, your your fellow your RCMP officers have to deal with. I'm wondering if even the formula makes sense anymore, or if we need to advocate that you know there's just more more power, more resources required because the the cases are just more complex than we've seen five years ago or ten years ago. That that's a great comment, and through to the chair, um, we've been working on formulas for decades. Uh, and it depends uh, which part of the equation, what formula you want to use, because it's beneficial uh, for some that want re resources, maybe not for those that have to pay for the resources. Uh, we, we have uh, a system we're using in the province right now. It's called front resource, uh, frontline resource allocation system. And all of our policing is all entered on a computer, or we call it our status codes, our busy codes. What are we doing? What are we going to? So it's a matter of what is the formula of how much time are our police officers spending on the calls for service that are coming in, and every community is different. Uh, so we have what we call a provincial resource allocation committee within the RCMP for the province that they're the final ones that have a say of where our provincial resources uh, go in regards to their formula, but th there is no one stop formula that's agreed upon with the various uh, RCMP units, agencies, and, and the government, and, and we continue to work on that, because you're absolutely right. Um, when we talk about crime rate, just so everyone knows, whether somebody's calling about a, a noisy wind chime that their neighbor has, so they can't enjoy their property, it's called uh, mischief, versus an attempt to murder. That counts as one check mark. So how is that fair when you talk about crime rates and caseload and stuff like that? So that's where the crime severity index comes into play, uh, which measures uh, the, the crime. So it's a work in progress. We've been trying to perfect this for decades and decades and decades, and we continue to do that. Uh, I'm actually part of a committee on that just because we're a blended detachment, so I work in blended detachments. Uh, we're working on it, but it, it, we really rely on our area commanders, various detachment commanders, to put a context to the numbers that we're spitting out, because just numbers don't make sense either. We have to explain what they mean. Uh, there can be a detachment. Uh, I'll give you, real quick, I know we have to go, but I'll give you an example. I used to work at Port Alberni, as everyone knows. Their caseload is not the same as Penticton. Our caseload is quite higher here. But I will tell you this, uh, that is the violent community. So their cases have a lot more uh, resources required for them just because of the sheer violence that's involved there versus we're property crime driven in Penticton. So it's not apples to oranges. It's very complex and it's a matter of uh, our government partners agreeing with our, our methodology and our formula to properly distribute the resources in the province when there's money available for that. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Hunter, and to all your commanders. Uh, re we really appreciate coming forward and uh, keeping us up to date on all that is going on and what you are struggling with and, and how we can support you. Thank you. Can I pass, can I pass on over to the CAO in regards to uh, a new um, delegation, if they are ready? I'm ready. Okay, I'm fading out. I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, I'm ready. Sorry, I hit my button twice. Um, so uh, we had a very significant event uh, last August 
Uh, Mr. Chair, a natural uh, disaster, uh, Christy Mountain just outside Heritage Hills, uh, moving towards Penticton. And uh, it was a complex event, uh, uh, heightened by the weather, uh, lots of winds and predictions of where the fire might go. So uh, EMBC has provided funds to uh, do a after action report and uh, this is a joint report uh, on the regional district and the city of Penticton. Uh, we had uh, um, a crossover responsibilities on that and the interaction uh, provides a good uh, basis for discussion about where we go in the future. Um, but uh, I did wanna say that um, the scope on the study is limited to the Emergency Operations Center. I uh, had a good conversation with Chief Godry from the Cleveland Volunteer Fire Department uh, earlier this week, and he pointed out uh, this does not talk about site. This is just uh, the operations uh, uh, for support of the site through the Emergency Operations Center. And then, uh, so that does not give us uh, the opportunity to talk about the great job that our fire services did during that event and BC Wildfire Service. And of course, uh, Chief Godry has a long and distinguished history with BC Wildfire Service. Uh, so uh, he was able to provide uh, some suggestions to us uh, from his perspective on that and some corrections uh, that we've passed on to the consultant. Uh, but what I wanna do now is to, uh, and when I should mention uh, that we congratulate uh, Chief Williamson on his uh, uh, dedication to fire uh, response by uh, volunteering with the BC Wildfire Service. I assume that's volunteer, but uh, the city of Penticton still paid him. Um, but uh, he took over the structure prevention uh, uh, protection during that Christie Mountain fire, uh, which was a huge, huge endeavor and did a great job as always. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Paul Ersich from uh, Ally Man Emergency Management, and he's gonna provide his report on the Christie Mountain fire. Uh, thank you, Chair and Board. Uh, I'll move into uh, screen mode and uh, get right to it. Okay, so we'll go through for the next uh, 15 minutes a, a short presentation on the results of the after action review into the fire, uh, which has been introduced uh, well already. That's the agenda that will follow. Just a quick uh, overview of the incident to bring everyone back almost to last August uh, and to remember what happened back then. A discussion of how the after action review uh, was conducted and then some of the key recommendations. So there's our overview. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. You guys can probably read it faster than I can say it. Uh, but in essence, uh, kicked up uh, really close to uh, to a neighborhood. This wasn't something that started 20 kilometers away from anybody. It was right there next door. Quickly grew in size and within 24 hours, you were already into large scale evacuations, uh, evacuation orders and evacuation alerts. So not a lot of time to react. And then as it was discussed, a very uh, complicated response with lots of different agencies coming together quickly, coming together under conditions of COVID-19 and a pandemic and coming together under conditions where the regional districts, uh, IT uh, capabilities were severely degraded due to a uh, cyber attack. I would suggest that's a fairly complicated scenario to have to dig into. I would not build an exercise for my clients under those conditions. I would focus on getting ready for a wildfire I wouldn't throw the other stuff at it unless uh, it looked like we needed to spice things up. So well done to everyone under those conditions. The review itself uh, has already been introduced. It was uh, supported by EMBC and a joint uh, venture really between the regional district and the city of Penticton. Uh, we were approached to run it and we put it together uh, within a few weeks of planning. We were into the, into the event itself. Uh, we put together a survey and then ran some facilitated debriefs. We had four groups in the debrief sessions. We had district staff, city of Penticton staff, emergency social services volunteers, and then a bunch of other agencies like the RCMP, like BC Wildfire, like Interior Health, et cetera. Uh, of note that not every single person that participated in the incident was directly included in these sessions, but they were represented by those who had debriefed them separately. Uh, in addition, we put together um, recommendations and lessons learned. These key recommendations, we tried to keep it down to 10. The issue isn't finding recommendations. The issue is narrowing it down to the most important ones that you can move forward with. 
Uh, and we took that approach of trying to find really practical things that could be acted on um, and you could make progress forward. So these are the 10 and we'll go through each of these 10 uh, a slide each and that'll make my 15 minutes go by pretty quickly. First off, unity of command. In the incident command system or the BC emergency management system, there's a principle in an emergency that there's sort of one chain that, uh, that executes uh, command and control in the event. And in this case, we had at least two EOCs established, one by the city, one by the district. And the fire doesn't really care about jurisdiction. It's just going to do what the fire does, just like COVID doesn't care. It just does what it does. We have our own jurisdictions. We have lots of reasons for the way we're set up. But when you have multiple different lines coming into the same event, it can cause some problems. And we saw some of those problems down at the reception center, for example, where you might have had some of the people down there working to one of the EOCs, some of the people there working to the other EOC, and then there, you know, order, counter order, disorder. We had some issues down there occasionally because of that. Those sorts of things crept up. The recommendation here is to establish a joint EOC between both the district and the other major uh, party involved, in this case, the city of Penticton. Uh, the bylaws would support it, but I think there's some work to do to get to the point where you're um, comfortable putting that together. Uh, it would have solved a few issues that arose in this incident. Liaison officers are those that are empowered by whoever they work for, in this case, uh, the EOC, to go to another organization, embed with them, and be that direct link between the two organizations. They're not there to make decisions. Uh, they're there to represent your organization and be a, a communications conduit. In this case, there were some uh, shortfalls there. Uh, the idea that we came up with is establish a team that can kind of um, work together across these agencies before an event happens that explains, okay, my liaison officers are going to do this. Yours are going to do that. Here's what I'm going to need them to show up ready to do. Here's what I, they're going to need from you when they show up. Kind of iron that stuff out in advance. Identify your LOs in advance, train them, and then make sure they know their role, and then work together in advance of an incident so that when they show up, it's you know, it's Bob from the city, and we know Bob because we worked with him a bunch of times. It's not, who's that guy? What's he here to do? Uh, you got to build that common team up front. Communication and coordination comes up in every single incident that ever existed, ever, where there's more than one person involved. So there's no surprise that it came up here with so many different agencies. Uh, regular training and exercising is a great way to work through some of that kind of thing so that uh, language is understood, different means of communication, radios, phones, emails, whatever those forms are going to be, get practiced. Um, meeting before freshet or fire season. So this is the right window to start meeting with those agencies to talk about communication, to talk about how we're going to coordinate um, so that expectations can be made clear, phone numbers can be established, who's going to talk to who, those things can be ironed out in advance and still be fresh in people's minds. And then to go further and deeper on that, have a tabletop exercise with that as the specific uh, subject matter. The reception center um, was under a huge amount of stress with that many evacuees in such a short amount of time. So, and under COVID, it's, it's just a lot of pressure was uh, built up down there. So there were some personality issues that arose, I think, with some of the volunteers that were working. So that, that's that's a separate thing that needs to be dealt with at the kind of personal and coaching and mentoring level. But clear, clearer guidelines on some items would have mitigated some of that to some extent. Uh, so, you know, things like um, let's have a one number for all the volunteers to call in where it's one source of truth and one source of uh, direction on when they need to show up, for example. There's a few things that came out there. Role clarity was sometimes a challenge. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do in my role, or I don't know what the other person's doing in their role, but I have an idea. And so you wind up with some friction there. And uh, communication pathways about who talks to who and when. Training and exercising, as you can see, has come up a couple of different ways already. And it's going to come up, I think, um, in most different reviews. Uh, it improves outcomes, allows the unforeseen to be tackled. Like if you've practiced 90% of the stuff that you might come across, it's easier to handle the other 10%. If you've only practiced 10%, then you're left with 90% to solve on the day. Um, so a, that's a great way to build that trust and common understanding. It's difficult though. I mean, everyone's got a day job. Uh, very few people are dedicated to this 24 seven. And that means that you've got to build time in somehow and build resources in to make it happen. Uh, of note already as a part of this uh, after action review uh, and some of the recommendations you'll be receiving from Red Dragon Consulting a presentation 
uh, to the CAO group about an exercise that'll be coming up in March. And then you'll also, the Protective Services Committee will be receiving a refresher session on EOC leadership. So that's great that you've already moved out on that. Disaster psychosocial services. So these are the, the folks that show up from, um, from health. They show up and in an emergency, people may have lost loved ones. They may have lost pets. They may have lost their livelihood. They may not know uh, what their future might look like two hours from now in their own minds. There's no future. Who knows? There's a bunch of stress and pressure. They've been uprooted. Um, and the team didn't really know much about disaster so or disaster psychosocial or DPS up front, but as soon as they came on board and started to embed with the, the folks that were working at the reception center, uh, they were viewed as immediately helpful. I immediately, they had an immediate impact right there, right now, and the feedback was amazing. So the idea there is let's keep using them in future and build them directly into all plans that would involve any kind of an emergency um, support services capability. COVID-19, obviously, we're still living it. So this is very current for everybody still. But when you bring that many different people together from different organizations, everyone's got a slightly different approach to the way they're handling COVID-19 that can cause issues when you start to bring those, those groups together. Uh, had the event gone on for a lot longer, this might have been quite difficult for things like accommodations and feeding and other areas where you, you just start to mix those groups a lot more than maybe out on the fire line. Um, so the idea here would be build a team again in advance, much like the communications recommendations to talk about what COVID-19 protocols are going to be across the incident. Get common messaging out there. You know, some people think you could do it this way. Other people think you can do it the other way. Let's have one common message on that. And then as the event unfolds, have a network established that can deal with COVID-19 specific items and let the response continue being managed by others. So that if something comes up, hey, we don't know how we're going to feed 500 people in a COVID responsible manner. We didn't expect to have to do that. Well, you don't have to take the whole team off. You can just build a separate team to look at that. Business continuity, COVID is a business continuity issue, for example, um, as well. But uh, IT was kind of the bigger one that came out in this event where the uh, ransomware attack kind of crippled all the IT, a lot of the IT capability for the regional district. We were lucky that Ann Ben had managed to do some um, completely inadvertently had done some backups of some uh, some significantly important files and and forms on on a memory stick, and that was available. Um, but that wasn't part of a plan. So having the redundancy built into the system is going to be important. I'm not an IT guy, but that would have helped. And having someone embedded right in the EOC that can troubleshoot problems as they arise would have been also pretty useful. Evacuate registration and assistance or the ERA tool uh, was a relatively new tool last year that the province is rolling out through EMBC. It had been used in a few smaller scale evacuations, but nothing of this scale. And it was a bit more than beta, but not fully rolled out yet. So it was in pretty good shape. But the event here in Christie Mountain Wildfire really tested and pushed it. Uh, and so EMVC is going to continue regularly updating its program there and then local efforts to keep training on it and building familiarity will make it even more useful in the future. So while the people found it useful to use, it had some holes and some gaps that they that they discovered and feedback has been provided through EMVC on that. We also identified a bunch of quick wins. I've only picked out four here as examples, but there's a bunch more uh, there. So. The information section, those folks that are working on building the media releases and putting together um, conferences, press conferences and the like, give them another laptop and that would have increased their capability by quite a bit. So out of proportion to the, the resource. So it's just one small example of a quick win. Um, jotting down DPS as one of the phone numbers or one of the emails to outreach to immediately whenever there's an ESS or reception center activation. Um, in addition to training those liaison officers, have go bags set up that have, you know, cell phone chargers, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, a list of contacts, whatever they might need to just grab and go to wherever they need to embed with so that they can just deploy. It saves a half an hour or an hour instead of them searching around for all that stuff. And then, you know, feeding in particular was challenging on this in this event with so many people. COVID-19 had already disrupted business activity, so normal vendor relationships were already a challenge. And it was difficult to, for example, prepare and deliver food to the right location under COVID conditions. So do some of that homework in advance, identify those vendors in advance, you know, have a half formed logistics plan around that in advance, and it'll save a lot of pain uh, in the moment when you're trying to figure it out uh, when there's 500 hungry people sitting out there waiting for their lunch bag. 
Okay, so that was me going through those about as quickly as I could to try and leave some time for questions. Um, and uh, Chair, on that note, I think I will pause here and open the floor to any questions that people might have uh, of me. Thank you, Mr. Yurich. Uh, do we have anybody who has a question in, in regards to this and or follow up? Um, if we could have the screen for me coming down from his um, overhead, then I can see people. Thank you. I see um, Director Vazilaki. Thank you very much. Um, I heard the concerns that um, uh, that you had with uh, the Christie fire, and um, from what I gather, most of those concerns came because we had two uh, different um, EOC uh, units in place, one by the the original district and one by the city of Penticton. And that can create uh, problems where one has to communicate with the other to see what per, what they were doing concerning their own um, uh, items that, that they had to do uh, themselves. The question I have is how close or are there any meetings taking place to determine whether it's in the best interest of the original district to have two units like this or perhaps just the one whether it's the original district district or the city of penticton i know we're capable uh, and i'm talking about the city of penticton is capable of doing it we have the expertise on board so i'm wondering how close are we uh, in order to determine how we were this is going to be done before the next fire season comes along Thank I'll, you. Have to, I'll have to defer that question to uh, staff or another representative from one of the organizations on that. My apologies. Mr. CAO, could uh, you address that question at all? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so that is a topic of conversation at the CAO group uh, meeting. The board's aware or committee's aware that uh, under the regulatory bylaw, protective services is set up as the policy group for emergency management and the CEO group is now responsible as the planning team. Uh, so uh, approving budget for the service and then also looking at the coordination. Um, and we were going through the establishment bylaw as to how the uh, cost allocation was set out. So this is one of those uh, discussions at that group as to uh, how should a regional emergency management program look? And we are uh, meeting regularly on that, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, as was mentioned uh, somewhere in the presentation, uh, we do have a training session coming up on the 18th, so we'll invite the CAO group to sit in on that. And then there is uh, our preparations for an emergency exercise at the committee and CAO group level. Uh, that will also investigate this uh, coordination uh, on a regional level. Thank you, CAO. Uh, any follow-up to that? Director Vazilaki, is that good? No, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, could I move a uh, question from uh, Director Monteith? To the Chair, I'm wondering if it would be appropriate for us to have a review of the communication policy. I had some concerns about um, Director uh, Obrick, as an example, not being involved or um, through the communication um, when we were doing the joint press releases and stuff. So I was wondering if I could make a motion to have the communication policy reviewed. Uh, to the CAO. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So you can't make a uh, motion right now because we're in delegation. Uh, but once you get back into uh, session at committee, then uh, sure you can put that on the floor. Thank you. Uh, Director Canodal. During a fire, or just shortly after that fire, I heard a concern raised from some of our fire chiefs that uh, firefighting resources uh, that were available locally uh, were, uh, were not called up uh, at primary. Uh, but sources were actually brought from the lower mainland before the local sources were 
uh, uh, called up, and and that is a little concerning that uh, that it would work that way. I'm just wondering if that's being addressed. Are there again? That's another one that is just the arbit the writer of the report, the gatherer of information. I don't know the steps that have been taken since then to uh, dig into that side of the response. Again, we were looking at site support as the main focus for this report, uh, and we didn't really dig into the the other side of it. The request went up to EMBC for additional support and put across to the Office of the Fire Commissioner, who would have then gone out to find those resources from wherever they saw fit. So I think that is probably where the question would go. If there's any further detail, then I do need to back out of the, the answer and turn it over again to either the CEO or staff that might have more information on any specifics there. CAO? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so that is more of a site question uh, as far as response goes, but uh, we did turn over consolidated command of site over to uh, BC Wildfire, and uh, they were then responsible for uh, calling in the resources that they needed in order uh, to fight the fire on the ground. Um, I, I had understood from the report that there were, uh, that there were many, many fire departments invited to participate uh, and in fact did, uh, even some volunteering uh, rather than having to be called out. Certainly our regional ones, uh, Okanagan Falls for sure and Cleden, uh, very involved in it. Um, but I, I think uh, they were available to be called if BC wildfire needed them. A follow-up question for Director Canodal? Yeah, that, it was, uh, that was more, uh, it wasn't that they weren't called at all, it's the order of, of uh, attachment that was uh, more the issue for our local chiefs. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully that'll be dealt with in the future. Uh, uh, Fire, fire resources should be uh, called up as sphere of influence uh, uh, spiraling out from the, the center. But uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Is that a leftover hand, Director Monteith? Okay, thank you. Uh, I see um, CAO Newell. Um, is that a leftover hand? Or do you have something more to add? Okay. No, I, was just gonna, I, I would not dare to contradict BC Wildfire when they're fighting their fires on the ground. Uh, I'm going to let them call out whoever they want to call out in order to accomplish what they need to do. Thank you, CAO. Um, do you have any other questions uh, for? Mr. Urich, and that are specifically in regards to this um, report? Okay, well, seeing none, unless there's uh, someone sees one that I don't have, um, I'd like to see if we can have a, a, a motion to adjourn for protective services. I see Director Gettens. And Director Trainer. Um, all in favor? Thank you. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Just a leftover hand from uh, CAO Newell. Thanks. So I call it adjournment of uh, protective services. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, Chair Roberts. So, folks, um, we're going to go ahead and have a break. We did have community services bumped ahead. So after break, we will go to corporate services. And that was originally scheduled for 12 o'clock. But my suggestion is we start that earlier, just in case it does take more time than we've allocated. Um, and that also will give us more time for environment and more time for lunch. So. We are at 11.10 right now. Um, is everybody okay if we were to proceed with corporate services at 11.30? Everyone's good. So if you want to go have a washroom break, coffee break, and we will start corporate services in 20 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, directors, thank you for coming back on time. We're going to get started with Corporate Services Committee, so have a look at your agendas, please. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda as presented, moved by Director Roberts, seconded by Director Bush. Call the question, all in favor? Thank you. Has to come down. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. We'll go to uh, item B. Southern Interior Local Government Association, SILGA, call for resolution, CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, we have to have our resolutions into SILGA by February 26th. So we would intend to have those uh, ready for adoption by the board on the 18th. So we need to advance them from uh, this meeting to the next. Uh, we've got six proposed resolutions that were attached to your report some more advanced than others. Uh, what we really want to do today is go through each of them, make sure that we've got the right intent uh, from whichever member proposed that specific topic, and then just get some more information to make sure that we can adequately phrase uh, the resolution. We don't have to wordsmith them today, but we do want to make sure that we capture the intent. And then uh, we're usually required to put some sort of a briefing note or some description uh, 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 with it when we send it in to SILGA. So um, I, I just turn it back to you then, uh, Madam Chair, and we should go through them one by one. Okay, great. Thank you very much, CAO. So I know that um, the board didn't doesn't have a breakdown of all of them in their possession because some are, are still being really worked on, but what we're going to do is have Danny load them. And then we just want to work through each one, and uh, Ms. Mulvin can, can speak to some of these or answer questions. Uh, but we had directors submit these topics, and we want to make sure that we're capturing, you know, the general, uh, the gist of the, of the request for this resolution, and it can be wordsmithed further. We will finalize in two weeks so that we can get them to SILGA by the deadline um, at the end of February here. So um, let's go to the first one, which is the five and a quarter percent provincial collection fee. And, and actually, that was something that uh, finance manager Zafino uh, brought to my attention. So I think this is a really interesting one in that we may find uh, other regional districts quite concerned with and in support of. Uh, Ms. Malden, is there anything that you wanted to comment on on this, or we're we just looking for comments or questions from the directors? Um, yeah, no, I have nothing to add to this. I think this is one that may have gone out in advance, so that's a good thing for the directors to okay. have an opportunity to look at. And, and I think Jim's around if there's any questions. Okay, great. So, directors, um, oh, CAO Newell, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. So uh, you'll know better than I, Madam Chair, uh, what SILGA and UBCM look for, but I believe they look for uh, uh, sort of, uh, issues of a provincial um, interest. And this one will be specifically of interest to regional districts. So of the 200 or so local governments at uh, UBCM, uh, 29 of them may be interested in this. So uh, I, I think we should put it forward. I'm just not sure what category of a resolution they may place this in when it gets to UBCM. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Director Bauer. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just uh, would like to see the therefore a uh, little more concrete. Uh, it's never good to have a resolution. And again, you probably know more about this. When you do a, do this or do that kind of suggestion. So either we're going to say reduce the fee and or we're going to say eliminate it. I, I wouldn't offer a, a do this or that. Okay, thank you for that. And I believe we have, uh, I can't see all the um, participants, but I believe we have uh, Mr. Zafino present in case there is a, any feedback. I see Director Gettens has a, a question or comment. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you to the chair. I'm just curious, where did like where in the province does the money go? Does it go to a, a like a specific part of the provincial government, or like what's the money for? What does it support? 
Mr. Safino, are you able to ask for that? I don't know exactly. I'm assuming general their general government. Okay. Um, is that something, Mr. Zafino, that you might be able to find out? Yes, I, I will look into it. Okay, that would be great. And then we could have that information for the next uh, meeting when we finalize these. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Holmes, go, oh, sorry, Director Gettins, did you have a follow-up to that? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Just as a quick follow-up, and I, I do actually agree with Director Bauer that I, if it is due to COVID, I think we need to put a tighter time frame around it and what exactly we're looking for. I think we'd have a better chance of getting it passed then. Right, so um, I just want to clarify. So the 5.25% admin fee isn't specific to COVID, correct, Mr. Zavino? This is happens every year? Yes, that's that correct. That's, a, that's an administrative yeah. expense that happens every year. Right, so I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, just as a, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, but I think we're asking it due to the COVID crisis causing hardship on property owners, and that's why, like, that's the reason why we're asking for the reduction. But, so I think if it is because of COVID, and that money otherwise mm -hmm. was something that we as taxpayers in the province need to need to have that money go towards, then we should limp, we should put a box around this a little bit. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. I'm going to go to CIO Newell and then to the Director Holmes. Go ahead, CIO. Yeah, so this is not COVID related. This is an ongoing annual expense. And uh, uh, Madam Chair, it would be for the cost of the province of uh, administering the uh, tax collection for every local government, uh, incorporated local government in British Columbia. They do their own, so they would have to have uh, clerks. That would do uh, uh, like a tax clerk, uh, where in this case it's the province that would be collecting the information, generating the invoice, sending it out, collecting it. Uh, they're, they're just administrative costs associated with uh, administering the fee. So um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how they calculate that cost. Uh, a lot of organizations will have just a straight 10% administration fee on any service they provide to another party in this case it looks like it's five and a quarter uh so uh, no harm in us asking for it to be reduced i would doubt if it would be waived okay thank you director holmes go ahead please uh yes thank you um i was going to ask about that covid um mind in there about the covid as well being a reason i i would i would wonder i'm wondering uh, if we should just maybe take out the reference to COVID altogether uh by the time the government gets around to looking at this uh, and th they'll look at that and the pandemic will pretty much be over and they'll say oh well this doesn't apply anymore so maybe uh and if if it's not related to COVID, then why do we have COVID in there it's 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 just a, it's not a it's an unfair fee uh or it's too much we should ask it to reduce on its own merit and um Try to pin it on COVID, so I, I would suggest we just remove that that one line. Great, thank you very much, Director Holmes. Yeah, that's a good point. By the time they get around to seeing this, we're hoping the COVID crisis has been uh, at least everyone has their vaccinations by then. But it, I think we could really be looking at pressing that the the admin fee be reduced, not. Um, not waived, but reduced for as an ongoing fee. Um, but looking to see what others think, we've got Director Roberts next. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, as a follow up to Director Bauer and what uh, you were just talking about as well. Um, usually, when I've done a resolution and you want something at one end and it could end up being reduced, you usually start with what you would like to have and then they can go back in regards to negotiation. So, I'm not sure how that, you know, a little bit different regards to labor relations, but uh, I would have put it eliminated and then if it comes up as reduced as which we assume that it's a step in the right direction and it looks like a compromise. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Gettins, go ahead, please. Thank you, the Chair. Can we just have the screen scroll down a little bit? This is different than what we have in our agenda and I just want to see the recommendation 
should consider exempting the fee from the following, but I can't see the list of items. Thank you. Okay, were there any other comments or suggestions? There's, we have some feedback for this to be tweaked further and come back in two weeks to be finalized. Director Gens, is that a leftover hand? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other um, hands here on, well, you should, I need to have you use your, um, hand button folks, just because we have the resolutions on the screen, I can only see a few of you. So I'm not seeing anything further there. Let's move on then to resolution number two, please. That's the derelict vehicles on Crown land. So um, can we just scroll to the right a little bit, Danny, so we can get that on the screen more? That's only yours. Oh, is it me or just me? Okay, thank you. Just have a quick read, directors. Okay, are there any comments or suggestions? Uh, CIO Newell, go ahead, please. I can't remember who uh, brought this one forward. I know it's an issue for us. Uh, we had this discussion when we brought forward our derelict vehicles on Crown land uh, policy and that there are many agencies involved in this. Uh, unfortunately, one of them is federal. Uh, certainly the RCMP are very involved in it, but they administer the provincial contract. So I think we could go through the province uh, for all of them. Um, but there's MOTI, there's FLNRO, there's the RCMP, uh, th there's actually uh, ICBC uh, has a role in this. So uh, nobody knows who to talk to uh, whenever they have a complaint about a derelict vehicle. Um, and uh, it's uh, really tough to get enforcement. It's not a very high priority for any of those agencies. Uh, and usually it's our elected officials that uh, get the complaints from the ratepayers, So uh, I think it's a good idea to put this in, um, but uh, we don't, we weren't advanced enough to actually uh, wordsmith a resolution. Okay. Are there any suggestions? We will see this come back in two weeks. And keep in mind, if you think of something uh, further of note, you can certainly email in a comment. Oh, I see Director Monti has a hand up. Go ahead, please. To the chair, I know that this is something that Director Obrick is quite passionate about. So maybe we could tax him with uh, supporting this uh, resolution. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Molden, are we able to send this one out? This one didn't get out via email, and then um, Director Obrick might have some feedback for that. Yes, I just sent this out um, in an attachment with no intro or anything, so I did send this out. I will resend it later with um, any of the additional information okay. that we've heard today, okay. so yes, definitely. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Director Spencer Coyne, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm just wondering, we have on here designate one ministry or coordinating body. Why would we not just ask for the RCMP to be able to remove them? They can do a VIN search right there on the spot and see if it's owned by anybody, try to, you know, just like any other vehicle, why why would we try to complicate it by getting the ministry involved if the province has said to the RCMP, this is part of your contract, if there's derelict vehicles, have them towed at the expense of the owner. It's an idea. Okay, so uh, Director Coyne, your suggestion is that within this resolution that we uh, suggest one ministry or RCMP that we add that component. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Director Roberts, you have a comment? Yes, thank you. And to uh, follow up uh, to the chair and to follow up uh, <clears throat> uh, Director Coyne, um, 
I think the issue would be uh, a little bit more challenging. RTMP is one point in regards to them finding VIN numbers in regards to um, whether or not something is stolen or who actually owns it. I think we would have a, a challenge getting a, a federal police service to be responsible for actually the towing. So like, for instance, a lot of the discussions I've been having with Sergeant Hughes is that they're quite willing to be there, be supportive, be around in case of um, angry or upset um, citizens and, and to be able to itemize which vehicle is owned by whom. But then, uh, for instance, in regards to the highways or if it's uh, Flynn Row and its environment, then it's the responsibility of those agencies or whoever is the lead of agency to actually get um, a vehicle. And of course, as I was brought up earlier by um, uh, Sergeant Hughes, um, I'm working with um, Mr. Andrew Reeder and his team uh, to come up with a pilot project in the Headley area to propose to the community where um, we're kind of coordinating it, it, but needing the support and everybody to play nice in the sandbox. I think the long run, it's who's paying for it. It's, a, it's the financial burden and um, that I think it's really important um, as well, because sometimes we can coordinate something, but we shouldn't be paying for it. Okay, great, thank you for that, Director Roberts. I think Director Spencer Coyne, that's a leftover hand. Yeah, okay, thank you. Were there any other comments or suggestions on this one? Okay, I think we can move on then to resolution number three, which was an organ donation presumed consent. I believe that was Director Robertson that uh, brought that one forward, and I know Director Overick had strong support for this at that time. Yeah. <clears throat> Are there any comments? Yes, Director Vasilaki, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, before we go any further, can we get Spencer to turn a little cute baby around so we can have a look? Oh, for uh, Christ's sake. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, I mean, we don't see beautiful little things like that uh, at our meetings very often, and this is, a, uh, this is a prime example of what we should be looking at, the future of the Okanagan and some milk -amine. Yeah, and I can't see because I can only see a few uh, folks on there. I'll have to take a look later. Uh, Director Robinson, you had a comment, please. Go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to thank whoever drafted up the rev resolution. It's perfect. Uh, couldn't have done a better job myself. And I'm a very, very strong supporter of this, and I, I hope the board really gets behind it. Uh, if we can just save one life, that, that would make it all worthwhile. Thank you. Great. Thank thank you, Director Robinson. Danny, have you got number three up? I, it is also in your package. This one was sent out ahead of time. Um, anybody else have a comment on resolution number three before we move on to number four? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody. All right, let's move on to resolution number four, uh, COVID funding deadline for regional districts. So uh, that one right now has not been written up. Um, Ms. Malden will be working on that one. Um, and if, we, if I am correct, that had to do with the, the deadline that is given to regional districts on spending by the end of the year, but it's not the same deadline uh, applicable to municipalities, and I've heard this brought up by other uh, electoral area directors in the EA forum that I participated in on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, Director Oberth was part of that as well, so it is something that we're hearing from others. Did anybody have a suggestion? I see CCA Newell has a hand up. Go ahead, please. So just for clarification, Madam Chair, so there's the deadline issue, uh, and so for those that don't remember, uh, regional districts have an obligation to spend their money by the end of the year or we have to give it back. Uh, the other issue is the, uh, I thought, and I can't remember when this came up again, but uh, I thought there was an issue uh, with regards to how funds were allocated. Uh, there seemed to be a higher uh, uh, formula for incorporated communities compared to what regional districts get. Do we want to address that as well? 
Yeah, thank you, CIO. So I have, um, once we get through these resolutions, I have a, a motion to bring forward that came out of the EA Director's Forum for immediate action. It, it needs to be looked after right away instead of going to SILGA in April and then going to UBCM in September. So um, from that EA Forum, this resolution seems to be applicable to do with, with the deadlines. Um, they want the province to know that in the future, you know, don't don't tie our hands like that. So I think we're okay to proceed with that one. And once we get through the resolutions, I'll bring up this motion to do uh, with the funding formula. Okay. Anybody else with the comments regarding funding deadline? Okay, so we'll see that get drafted up and we can review and finalize in two weeks. So resolution five was uh, through Director Bauer, that's flood mitigation response that's in your packages. Did anybody have any comments, uh, questions or suggestions on number five? Not seeing any. I'm assuming Director Bauer, you're you're good with this resolution as drafted. Okay. If there's nothing on that, we'll move on to number six, which has come in through Director Pendergraft on 911 drop calls, which we know has been a, a serious issue for the RCMP. Um, not just this past year, but for multiple years. Anybody have any suggestions on that? I think Director Pendergraft submitted a lot of the background on this. So uh, um, please let us know, Director Pendergraft, if, if something is missing from that or needs to be adjusted. Okay, any questions, comments, is, or is everybody good? Okay, uh, seeing that there's nothing further on these, we do have a recommended motion and we're looking for somebody to move the motion uh, that we are going to proceed with the six of these and, and, and then finalize them in two weeks. Is anybody willing to make that motion? Director Gettens, I believe you're moving that, followed by Director Pendergraph is seconding. So I'll just ask if there's anything further. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Hands can come down. Uh, looking to have Director Coyne hand out. Thank you. Anybody opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Thank you. And I'll ask Danny to take the resolutions down from the screen, please. And so, folks, what I'd uh, like to do now before we adjourn this meeting is bring forward a motion. Um, and this came out of the Electoral Area Directors Forum. Um, I know Director Obrick was on that forum with me. I don't believe any other electoral directors were there. I didn't see anybody else from our team in that forum. But there was a lot of discussion on the funding formula. Uh, many EA directors not feeling it, it was fair. Uh, also wondering how that formula came to be. And um, our representative who we have elected to uh, represent us at UBCM is uh, EA Director Grace McGregor. And so she is doing a push to have different regional districts write to the Premier, to UBCM uh, on this issue to lend support to her voice. And she didn't feel, and, and the other EA directors agreed that if we wait uh, to September, it's, it's just too late, especially if there's future COVID funding that the province may decide to do. They need to know sooner than later that we have some concerns with that. So uh, my request is uh, a motion that we write a letter to Premier Horgan, to UBCM, and we'll also CC uh, Director McGregor in that letter that we do have uh, concerns regarding the COVID restart funding um, and the province-wide allocation of that fund. Uh, Director Knodel, are you moving that or do you have a question? You're moving that? Okay, thank you. Is there a seconder for that? 
Director Roberts is seconding. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Okay, and uh, I call the question then on this. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And was anybody opposed? Okay, that motion carries. And then what we'll do is we will add that to the agenda of the board meeting this afternoon so that it can get taken care of right away and we can get a, a letter out um, to help uh, Director McGregor on that issue. So folks, that takes us to the end of Corporate Services Committee. Unless there was anything further, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn the committee. Uh, Director Spencer Coyne's moving, Director Santa's seconding. Call the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. And anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. We are adjourned from corporate services and um, we're moving along quite nicely. That does allow us to have some extra time for environment and committee, should that be needed. So I'm going to turn environment and infrastructure committee over to Chair Geddens. Go ahead, please, Chair Geddens. Great, thank you to the chair. Um, can I get a motion, please, to accept the agenda for the today's committee meeting? Thank you, Director, second Director Bauer. All in favor? Opposed? Pass. Um, over, we've got a delegation. Lisa Scott from Oasis, over to you, CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, uh, we are a bit early, but I understand that Ms. Scott has uh, joined into the meeting. So uh, this is just uh, an update on OASIS. And uh, we could turn that right over to Ms. Scott, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. Welcome, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Um, good morning. It's still morning. <laughs> Have you just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, good morning, um, uh, Madam Chair and directors. Um, I will just share my presentation that I have for you. I've got a PowerPoint presentation here to provide you with an update um, on the activities we did last year, as well as our results. All right, I believe you can see that now. Um, so I will move forward. So um, just a summary of, uh, or just to get going, of course, um, we, like everybody else, were faced with um, COVID-19. We needed to address various protocols, which we developed our own in-house protocols, a risk assessment, and also a response plan. Um, that we put into play last year. Uh, it worked quite well. We did in fact have two staff members present COVID-19 symptoms. So um, we did run through our protocols and they did work well, which was great. Fortunately, nobody had COVID, but we were ready to go and we will be adjusting those for this coming year. Um, at this time, it's just myself working and I have a full-time assistant, uh, Sierra as well. Um, it uh, having COVID-19 last year uh, did affect us in some ways, but not so much the field work. Um, we obviously couldn't carpool as much, so there were some additional mileage costs. But the biggest impact to our program was the, um, the community events and the face-to-face -face interactions that we so love doing. Uh, we weren't, of course, able to do that. So a lot of the in-person outreach activities were moved to an online platform, which I'll talk about in today's presentation. There we go. Um, and I should have said, I think everybody knows who I am, but uh, in case you don't, I am the executive director of, of the society. Um, so uh, 
as per previous years, um, we have about uh, 20 give or take funders every year um, to make up the complement of our program. And we are largely focused on invasive plants still, um, but about 10% of our program is dedicated to aquatic invasive species and that's the of course doing our best to work with our partners throughout the province and the provincial government to keep invasive mussels out but also um, and I, I introduced the uh, Asian clam to you this time last year we're also that's been hitting the news a bit it is a aquatic invasive species that's in British Columbia, but not known to occur in the Okanagan, but we know it's in a Suez Lake on the Washington side. So again, I'll talk a bit later about what we did in regard to addressing that. Um, in addition to that, there are emerging species beyond the plants and the aquatic species, and namely this is insect pests like the brown marmorated stink bug that you can see on this slide. So in terms of our um, in the invasive plant program, I've got some stats here. So as per every year, we cover all electoral areas with our treatment program. Our treatments are a combination of surveys um, and treatments include chemical treatments as well as uh, mechanical, which involves you know, cutting, digging, hand pulling. Um, sometimes we do seeding and some years we do biological control releases. Um, the stats I have here show you that we targeted 32 species this year throughout the regional district. Um, in terms of treatments, we had almost 900 treatments covering 23 hectares and 325 mechanical treatments covering 9 hectares. If any of you are interested in the specific stats for your um, your electoral area, just don't hesitate to be in touch with me and I can provide that for you. So this is for the entire regional district. I do want to highlight um, a project I'm really proud of that um, was new to us in 2020. Um, Doug Reeve from your office was in touch with us uh, with regards to Garnet Park and Heritage Hills. Um, this lovely conservation area um, was very inundated with um, a lot of thistles as well as burdock and our crew came in um, and myself included to do an initial assessment. We dedicated 165 person hours to this park. Uh, we're pretty proud of the results. Um, because it was June, most of the plants had gone to seed and they had been seeding for this, this is quite a few years of weeds building up here. So we had a big job on our hands, but uh, I will draw your attention to the number of kilograms of weeds that were taken out through mechanical treatments. So. Um, 1,375 kilograms. So you can see the before and after uh, shots there that show the uh, magnitude of the impact we had. Um, of course, I think everybody knows it's not a one year one shot deal. So um, I have spoken to um, Mr. Reeve about returning there this year, um, as long as the budget's there to do so. As I alluded to earlier, um, a lot of our outreach went to a digital platform. Uh, so we did a lot of social media posts. We, we don't use Twitter yet, but we use uh, Instagram and Facebook and our followers increased significantly this year. I think so many people um, sitting at home and spending more time online. So we took advantage of that. We did close to 160 posts. A lot of them were weekly um, posts like um, Wildflower Wednesday, Field Crew Friday. So we carried through with a the theme. Um, we've, uh, myself and other staff members, um, took advantage of some free training opportunities and we still are through webinars. So um, we're again, um, quite uh, proud of the uh, advancements we've made with our social media platforms. Uh, last year, we also, uh, we established a YouTube channel 
And you may recall last year, I played for you the Invasive Muscles Why Care video that uh, our staff member Sierra put together. And uh, we, um, we heard the changes that you were looking for and we, we made them and we released this video as our first video on our YouTube channel in May. And we very quickly got over a thousand views um, and it's still growing. So very excited about that. And we also started an Instagram TV channel. So that allows us to show very brief um, videos usually about up to 15 seconds or so on um, or, or 50, 15 seconds to up to no more than about three minutes on uh, Instagram. So that can show how to identify puncture vine. That's an example of a, of a video we showed on Instagram last year. Um, a big part of the program every year is uh, uh, reaching out to constituents, or I should say they reach out to us um, in response to press releases, uh, social media posts, articles in the newspapers, and so on. So I just wanted to show you some um, of the stats of that. And there is a handout that um, Zoe Kirk has, um, I believe, circulated to you today that will um, so you'll have a copy of this as well. But this shows that out of the um, close to 150 landowners or land managers that reached out to me last year, 90% um, of their questions were still related to plants, 5% to aquatic invasive species, and then the remainder to um, other invasive species. Whenever people call me, um, I try to remember to ask them how they knew to call. And um, this provides us really useful information to see how our approaches are working. Is it through newspaper articles? Is it online? Um, are they a previous contact and so on? So this really shows that um, we really are a trustworthy source of information. Because you'll see at the bottom in yellow, um, so 29% was through referrals. A lot of that is through um, front desk staff at the regional district or other municipal offices or uh, provincial government staff saying, hey, give Oasis a call. But then if you look up to the top in that pale blue, 28% um, of the inquiries were related to individuals who are just familiar with our program or myself. Um, and then 26%, so just over a quarter, um, we've helped them before, their previous contacts, they're coming back to us for more information. So this again, as I say, is really useful information for us. I'm sure this will pique your interest too. So this is a breakdown by municipality or area. So where are these individuals um, calling us from? So it's not surprising, um, uh, quite a significant number from the city of Penticton and from Summerland, and then um, all electoral areas and all municipalities reached out to us at some point. Um, so that's, that's valuable information again. And uh, again, be in touch with me if you have any questions about that, but we do, um, provide publications and information to each and every um, sector of the regional district. Uh, you may recall we have um, received funding in the past through the South Okanagan Conservation Fund and we, we received funds for the first two years of the program um, and part of the second year of funding um, we were uh, to produce a plant-wise guide for the South Okanagan. And I'm pleased to say that um, we are, that is completed now. Um, it did take longer than we expected, but um, all good things take time. Uh, and a big part of the delay was um, a lot of really intense work that we did with uh, the Anaukan Center, we worked with them over a period of a year to do insulction translation. And uh, it's created a very useful and exciting um, uh, product. 
And we're very proud of this partnership um, with the Analkin Center, and we will be doing a big launch of this new booklet, which will be available both digitally um, and in print. Um, and we'll do a big launch of that this spring. And uh, we'll have to, of course, see where COVID takes us, but um, we'll do our best to um, get this circulated broadly. And I've been getting lots of requests already about it, and we haven't even officially announced that it's been produced. So this booklet, as the title suggests, it goes through, um, I think there's 19 species in here of invasive plants that are still uh, sought by landscapers and horticulturalists, landowners to plant in their gardens, but they're invasive. So we let them know that they're invasive and we provide um, uh, drought wise uh, alternatives that are much more suitable and most of them are native species. Um, I will add that um, we did receive funding last year through the conservation fund to do a third and final year of this project but because it's largely a um, program that we deliver in person we did decline the funding and we reapplied for the current year but unfortunately we were declined um, so i am seeking um, other sources to continue this really worthwhile program um, this year and in future years I've spoken to you before as well about um, OISO, Okanagan Invasive Species Online. This is a new website. It was started in um, 2018, um, but we've continued to work on it and had additional funds through the province and the federal government. We are wrapping it up now in terms of um, the work that we've done on it. Um, since its inception in 2018, we've tripled the number of species on here. We have almost 70 species. Um, and just as a reminder, this is a kind of a one-stop shop for the Okanagan Valley targeting the agricultural sector. It's part of the climate change uh, initiative. And so, yeah, in 2020, we we tripled the number of species. So again, it's largely plant species, but there's also insects, um, mammals, birds, um, aquatic plants. Um, and what we also did in 2020 is um, based on our, our existing users, we kept getting asked, is there an app? Is there an app? We'd like an app. So we did an app. <laughs> so there's a free app downloadable for both Android um, and for um, Apple um, users. So um, take a look if you're not familiar with this website. Moving on briefly to our aquatics program. Um, at this time, of course, this is not funded by the regional district, but you are a partner and you administer some of the funds that we've received. And I wanna start off right away um, with my first bullet is thank you so much to all of you who um, so kindly provided grant and aid, grants in aid for our new life jackets. So um, thank you so much for um, Director um, Coyne for getting the ball started on that. And it just kept rolling and the funds kept coming from you last year. So thank you so much. Um, it was a reduced program um, because so much of our aquatic um, program is going to community events and talking to people about clean, drain, dry, and don't move a muscle. And so, of course, most, well, all of these events were, were canceled because of the pandemic. And we also, um, we didn't think there'd be many boaters coming here, but holy cow, as you all know, it was a lot of people were out recreating and, and boating last year. Um, and we did end up running a uh, interaction at the boat launches that was socially distanced and it went quite well, but it was definitely reduced from past years. So much of our information was provided in digital resource packages um, to those businesses up and down the valley that sell boats, rent boats, um, yacht clubs, marinas, and we circulated a hundred uh, digital packages. So those were really well received. Um, 
much of our work was through our sampling. Um, you can see Sierra here in the image. Um, we get funds from the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation. We sample the waters for the larva of the mussels. And we also um, deploy monitors uh, to looking for the adult mussels. And I'm happy to say that BC still appears to be free of invasive mussels. Um, the regional district is also administering the RBC Tech for Nature grant that was received last year and we're the delivery organization. This is a citizen science program, so we are working with landowners um, who have lakefront property that are willing to um, deploy monitors to look for mussels. Uh, we had um, 19 individuals joined last year, which was fantastic in the Valley Bottom Lakes. And we also trained volunteers to do shoreline searches on Asuyas Lake looking for the Asian clam. So again, that's all funded through the RBC Tech for Nature grant. All right, I am wrapping up, but I would be remiss if I didn't let you know our exciting news. We are a quarter of a century old this year. So yeah, 25 years old. So that's me, 15 years old, just kidding. But anyway, that's me back in 1997. And um, we did start in 1996. Um, this is the first article I could find in my files, but you'll see by the title, um, we knew back then we had a battle on our hands already. So um, being our 25th year, we will be doing lots of celebrations. Hopefully some can be in person. So I'll just say, um, if you have any ideas, let me know, but uh, um, otherwise stay tuned and you'll, you'll be hearing more. Great, thank you, Ms. Scott. That was excellent. Um, thank a really you. great presentation. Um, I'm just gonna go to the board to see if there are any questions. And if you could use your hands, just because I can't see everybody, that would be great. Oh, there we there's everybody. Um, I actually have a question. I don't see any questions yet, but I do have a question, and I, I don't. I'm just curious about when we have businesses that are selling invasive species. Is there not any regulation or anything around that, so we can't buy the invasive species in the first place? Do you know anything about that at all? Um, I, yes, uh, Madam Chair, um, I am familiar with. Um, the issues around that and it, it's an ongoing issue and I guess probably you're largely refer referring to invasive plants more than anything. Um, we, along with many of our colleagues around BC, have been pushing for uh, legislative change to ban the sale of invasive plants and we've taken that message to the um, Select Standing Committee um, on Government Finances uh, every year for the last, I'd say, six years. <laughs> and it has been a recommendation um, that's come out of that review committee, and yet nothing has transpired yet. Um, they are, they have been looking for a few years at um, changing the very archaic Weed Control Act for British Columbia, but that's been stalled many times and is probably going to be um, completely revamped to an invasive species act in the foreseeable future. Um, I would add that um, regions can make that change and actually um, uh, the, I believe it's the, uh, is it Squamish Zoe that just yeah. is making their change. Um, the municipality of Squamish uh, has just gone through third reading of their new bylaw, and that includes um, in their boundaries, they are banning the sale of all invasive species. So that includes um, pet shops too, so you won't be able to um, possibly purchase goldfish um, or the um, invasive turtles and so on. But right now, provincially, there is nothing stopping the sale of invasive species. Oh, that's great. Thanks, sir. My dog's barking in the background. Thanks for that. I think that's kind of an interesting um, an interesting idea, ban banning this regionally. Uh, just one more time over to the board to see if there's any other questions. Thank you. Oh, Director um, Monteith. 
To the chair, I just wanted to thank you, Lisa. Um, I've heard amazing reviews on the work you've done out in supporting Twin Lakes area, which is part of the area that I represent. So I just wanted to thank you for that, as well as I know that some of my other residents have reached out to you and just, you know, you've been a wealth of knowledge to them and shared information and supported them. So I wanted to thank you and I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you so much, Director Montes. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Roberts, please. Thank you to the chair. Uh, just a quick question in regards to all your written material. <clears throat> is there funding or things that have been out there in regards to other, let's say, more predominant language groups that we have so that we're making sure we're reaching um, these large groups, especially in uh, agriculture? Um, yeah, very good question, um, Director. Uh, we have done in that past, in the past, we have done some translations. Um, we did that specifically to some of our um, puncture vine materials um, we translated into um, Punjabi, um, but we haven't done so for a while. So that's a really interesting point. Um, I will definitely look at opportunities to do some translation. I, I appreciate that input. Thank you, Director. Um, Director Monteith, is that just a leftover or a follow-up? Leftover, great. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. Let us take one more look. Nope, I'm not seeing any. So thank you so much for your time, Ms. Scott. That was really informational and appreciate everything that you are doing. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Our pleasure. Um, so our next item on the agenda is oh, Billy and Cam and Emma, respectfully to land for the noxious test. So I'm going to refer this over to the CAO, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, so this is regarding the four landfills that are owned and operated by the regional district. So Campbell Mountain, Oliver, Okanagan Falls, and the Karameas Transfer Station. And we have a regulatory bylaw, and it appears to me that we want to make some changes uh, to some of the definitions and then some other housekeeping changes. So we'll turn this over uh, to Zoe, and she, uh, I believe, has a presentation on this. Great. Thanks. Go ahead, Ms. Kirk. Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, actually, we're, we're going to take a little bit of a sideways a juncture from that. Our presentation today uh, from my side is with Emma Cameron, who's been our Canada summer job student. She's in the Similkamine room with Cam. So once she's presented um, on the Noxious Pests program, then I'll turn it over to Cam if you don't mind. Uh, but Emma has been with us and uh, I think I've been to the board several times saying we're, we're gathering momentum, we're, we're rolling over the money in the Noxious Pest Program, which is the service that the RDOS has that deals with those types of pests that are going to infect fruit trees. And that was a bylaw put in place many decades ago in order to protect the commercial industry. And because it's a bit of an outdated program, it was wonderful to have fresh eyes look at it, revamp all of our materials, look at how we can best get this information out to residents who have either inherited a fruit tree because they've come into the region and when we've subdivided these large acreages often they leave the fruit trees so this was a way of just taking a, a brand new look at the program and i'm hoping that danny has it all teed up because emma's there in the similkameen room and he has a presentation that he could just launch right from where he sits so we'll let that roll that's great. Thank you, Emma and Cam. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So my name is Emma Cameron. I've been working as both the recycling and noxious pest education student. And to give you all a little bit of a background on myself, since you don't know me, I am from Summerland. I completed my Bachelor of Science from Queen's University last June. And this upcoming fall, I'll be going to the University of Laval to start my master's degree where I'll be looking at how climate change is affecting high Arctic lakes. Um, so my time spent, I'll briefly go through um, some recycling stuff. So as a recycling education student, I was working with the solid waste group and I was responsible for providing educational strategies on how to properly sort at the Oliver, Karameas and Campbell Mountain landfills. Uh, but this presentation will be just on the noxious pest program and I would like to thank Canada Summer Jobs for this opportunity. And without further ado, if Danny, you could 
play the presentation, that would be great. Hi, Danny. I can't hear anything. Oh, yes. It should work now. Thank you. I'm not hearing. The Noxious Pest Program is increasingly important due to multiple factors. This is my final report on my time at the RDOS working on updating the Noxious Pest Program. This program aims to reduce the amount of insect pest problems by providing educational strategies and materials so that residential growers think twice before planting a fruit tree. It's currently a complaint-based program and has outdated materials, so I had the task to revamp the program. The Noxious Pest Program is increasingly important due to multiple factors. The first one that I noticed being the steady increase in people moving to the Okanagan. They may either inherit a fruit tree in their move or maybe want to plant a fruit tree to have more of that authentic Okanagan experience. Another is the influx of people wanting to be more self-sustaining with growing their own food. Both of these have led to more fruit trees being planted on residential properties that have a chance of being neglected. Climate change is also playing a role where warming temperatures allow pests that couldn't survive the winter in the past to now be able to do so. If a fruit bearing tree or shrub isn't cared for, it can lead to pest problems that can affect neighboring commercial orchards, which can have hundreds of thousands of dollars lost if pest problems occur. So if there's more education outlets for people thinking about planting a fruit tree, there will be more of an understanding of what they're getting into. To see why a revamp was needed, I initially traveled to most of the nurseries and greenhouses in the Okanagan Similkameen that sold fruit trees to see what they were doing to educate residential growers on their responsibility to prevent and control pests. Upon touring these nurseries and garden stores and in speaking with employees and owners, I quickly saw very inconsistent methods of pest education. Nearly all of these places had no formal educational strategies in place, but they did voice that they would greatly appreciate if the RDOS did more to provide them with guidelines and materials for how to go about educating individuals. Many of these garden stores and nurseries sell quite a few fruit trees per year. This one in the picture was one of the bigger ones and they had upwards of 200 fruit trees available for purchase. So by having a more robust and easily accessible program that follows the RDOS Noxious Pest Bylaw, it will in a way intercept these purchases by providing educational materials about the responsibility and types of pests that residential growers may encounter if they decide to plant a fruit tree. Creating new educational materials was an integral part of the program's revamp. Before creating these materials, I spoke with researchers and entomologists at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the BC Ministry of Agriculture, crop consultants, and other specialists about what they felt is important to include in educational materials. The first thing that I created were the fact sheet series. In doing research on current materials available to people searching for information on the web, I noticed that the resources available were often organized by pests, and I felt it would be easier to be organized by tree type. For example, with the materials that were available before my revamp, if somebody was wanting to purchase a cherry tree, the only materials on pests that would be available was tons of different websites that explained many different pests that may not even be applicable to our region. So by having one available by tree type, a worker at a garden store could easily pass the cherry tree fact sheet to them and it will have nearly everything that they needed to know. On each fact sheet, there's an indication of the bylaw, care strategies, pest prevention strategies, and the common pests at various life stages, as well as the damage it causes. Along with the fact sheets, there are PowerPoint presentations that follow the basic outline of these fact sheets and can be easily accessible on the RDOS website. These presentations are not just mutually exclusive to the Okanagan, as they mentioned that they can be applicable across all of BC. Next, I created a brochure and a banner that summarizes the importance of the program. And it can also be distributed at greenhouses and nurseries, as well as at farmers markets and other in-person events. This idea to create a pest identification and control matrix is what the future of the Noxious Pest Program can be built upon, in my opinion. It essentially has everything you need from pest identification with pictures 
to what fruit type it affects, as well as the damage it can cause, the active and overwintering period of pests so that you can know when there needs to be extra vigilance in tree fruit inspection, and the non-chemical mitigation techniques. Based off of the matrix, I also created a diary document through Excel that serves as a fillable log for residential growers so that they can track general care strategies, like when to prune and when harvest occurred, and if there were any insect pests seen, and if any control strategies were used. It's always advised that growers keep a diary for each tree, which is now provided by the RDOS, so growers can have an easier time tracking pest problems. All of the materials that I created here will be available on the RDOS website, as well as provided in a physical book that will be given to all of the greenhouses and, nur and nurseries in the Okanagan and Simil commune. I created materials that have essentially laid the foundation for the Noxious Pest Program and can therefore continue to be built upon. Due to COVID and the time of year that I started working on the program, there were a few restrictions that I faced when creating the materials and therefore had to adjust some of my ideas a bit. A simple thing that can be done is building on the PowerPoint videos that I created. I initially intended having video footage of some of the care strategies like pruning, as well as pest identification clips, but I was unable to do this as I didn't create the materials in the growing seasons as well as peak pest times, so it could be something that can easily be added when the time comes. My next idea is a bit more challenging, but I think it would be very beneficial to the program on a more long-term timeline. It's essentially a roundabout way to register your fruit tree, and with time, this could create a soft database of residential fruit trees in the Okanagan and Milkweed. To do this, growers can pledge to care for their fruit tree, and this will include writing down your address and fruit tree type. I think a good way to incentivize this is by offering a monetary incentive of something like $5 off at your local nursery or garden center or even more. This allows willing nurseries and garden centers to further be involved in the program and can contribute all or a portion of this incentive. Over time, a soft database of residential plantings will be logged and pest problems can be more easily tracked by the RDOS and can go beyond just being a complaint based program. A fairly simple form of advertisement for the program can be newsletters for residential tree fruit growers. This can be released on the RDOS website and on the Facebook page. This can include if that month is a key activity period for a certain pest and what trees should be pruned or harvested during that particular month. And can also include any incentives like the pledge idea that I brought up and can include any advertisements for items and events from local garden stores and nurseries. Another more long term idea of mine and a little bit more ambitious is building upon the matrix and diary that I created. This can be done through a type of mobile app available on your mobile device and can include a submission of the type of tree type you're growing. So it will personalize it and will include information on general care, pest prevention and pest control. It can also include a mobile version of the diary that can easily be accessible on the app so growers can log what's going on with their tree. Additionally, it can be used to provide notifications on when that certain tree experiences common pests, when pruning should occur, and when harvest should occur. This can be a longer term goal, of course, that encaps encapsulates the whole program in an easily digestible and usable format. Because this program has motivations in food security and climate, Contributors like Environment and Climate Change Canada, for example, could be potential players in the future of this program. That completes my presentation on my time spent revamping the RDOS Noxious Pest Program. I really see it being an even more important program going forward with more and more people moving to the Okanagan, as well as with the effects of climate change ramping up. So I think it will be even more crucial to continue to build upon the foundation of the new materials that I created. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well done, thank you, Ms. Cameron. Um, I'm gonna go over to the board to see if we have any questions, please. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. I was looking at the hands. Uh, Director Trainer. Hi, this is for Emma. Emma, that was a really good presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I actually have a really old cherry tree in my backyard. Um, so I got, I learned a lot from your presentation and I will definitely apply um, some of your tips. I was just wondering, 
Um, all of that information that you like your fact sheets, those are easy to find on the RDOS website because I think a lot of people in Summerland would benefit from reading that. All right, Ms. Cameron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's a great question. Um, so currently, the we're in the process of uploading everything to the RDOS website. It should be up really soon. We're kind of in the final stages of inputting everything on there. Um, so you should expect that fairly soon. I do have the videos up on the RDOS YouTube page, so you can go check out those and everything else should just come in the next little while. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Trainer. Uh, Director Montes, do you have a question? Great, thank you, go ahead. To the chair, I also wanna thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'm wondering who's gonna follow up from your great work because I see you have lots of great ideas and continuing it would be really important, I think. Um, I'm also gonna encourage staff to maybe do some sort of communication around the release of that information because it would make a great news story for the Facebook or communications to get up to, the, to our residents because I, the information is high value, so thank you. Excellent, thank you. Did you have anything to add to that, Ms. Cameron? I don't think so. If Zoe wants to say a little bit about the future with more students coming in, mm -hmm. um, she can go ahead and do that. Thank you to Thank the you. chair. Go ahead, Thank Zoe. You. Thank you to the chair. Yes, we, uh, so, uh, Director Monteith, we intend to do quite a good splash around this, um, but we wanted to make sure that Emma had her work done and that we were able to get the website revamped. As you know, we've been going through quite a trial with coming back online. Uh, so it will take a little bit of time to get these fact sheets, et cetera, onto the website. We will also be doing a, a small print run of all of these sheets. So they will be available at the nurseries. So I would anticipate by mid-March, we'll have everything out and we'll have a big splash around it. And we will continue. Excellent. We will continue if we have the ability to have Canada summer job student and, and COVID allows us to go in and do that filming, then we'll certainly get that done. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? I just want to make sure, Director Trina, that's left overhand. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Cameron. I love it when we have new eyes on an old idea. And I think that shift from having it by tree rather than by test <laughs> is gonna influence change that'll be long lasting. So that's something we should be really, really proud of. And good luck in your masters. I'm hopefully you'll come back and let us know how that went as well. So congratulations. Um, I think Zoe, uh, do I go over to you now for the recycling in the landfill discussion or is that over to you CIO? To the, to the chair, I think that goes back to the CIO unless Cameron has something that he needs to um, add from the smoke green room. Okay, thank you. I'll just hand it over to you, CAO. Thank you. Okay, so I am not sure what we're talking about right now, Madam Chair. Uh, I had saw uh, seen recycling landfill on the agenda, but I understand uh, that we may not have a report on that. And I'm not sure what went out with your agendas. Okay, I'm gonna pull up my agenda or if anybody else, then my screen's just gone. Uh, so maybe, Ms. Kirk, is that it then? We don't have anything to do with recycling? To the chair, as I understand from Cam, that was um, not to be put on, it was to be removed from the agenda. So um, okay. I believe that we are done. Thank you. <laughs> and it has been a sheer joy to work with Emma. And we wish her all the best. She gets to go to Ellesmere Island this year. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I just want to go, um, so CAO, I do have in my agenda um, to consolidate a waste management service regulatory bylaw and replace it with a new bylaw, or is that not supposed to be on the agenda? I saw reports in the folder for that, Madam Chair, but I understand it didn't go out with the agenda, so I assume we're going to do it next meeting. Okay, great. So with that, then I'll look for a motion to adjourn, please. Great, thank you, Director Bauer, second by Director McCorkoff. Anybody, are all in favor? Anyone opposed? Excellent, we are adjourned. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Chair Gettin. So folks, we are done early, so you get to have a luxurious lunch break. And uh, we can't start early. We have to start the board as advertised. So that's at 1.30 p.m. So we will be starting very promptly at 1.30 p.m. So enjoy your lunch break and we'll see you back at 1.30. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon, directors. We're going to get started with the regular board meeting. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome alternate director, Jim D'Andrea, who is filling in for Director Oberick today for Area D. Welcome, Jim. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Nice to have you here. Uh, folks, have a look at your agendas, please. This is your only opportunity to remove an item from the consent agenda. Did anybody have an item that needs to be removed from consent? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up here. Okay, um, I do need to make an addition to the agenda and that's coming out of the Corporate Services Committee meeting this morning. That was the motion. So that is going to be added to E4 under other business. So E4 will have the motion from Corporate Services Committee. Okay, so I'm looking for a mover to uh, move the agenda as amended. Director Pendergraf, Director Spencer Coyne seconding. I'll call the question then, all in favor? Okay, thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries, and I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda corporate issues. Moved by Director Bush, seconded by Director Pendergraf. Call the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. And I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda development services. Moved by Director Bush, seconded by Director Gettins. Call the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. And I'd like to advise any members of the public on the line that the items under consent agenda have been approved, if you are waiting to hear that, none were pulled. So that takes us down to item B, Development Services, Rural Land Use Matters. B1, Agricultural Land Commission Referral, Non-Adhering Residential Use, 300 Road 20 in Electoral Area C, CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. So this is an application to the ALC and we are recommending that it not be authorized uh, to proceed to the ALC on the basis that the Area C zoning bylaw uh, stipulates 90 square meters as a maximum uh, for an accessory dwelling and uh, this application is for 256 square meters. So that would be inconsistent with the bylaw in that regard. And also uh, the definition of accessory dwelling is uh, one living unit. Uh, and this would be, I believe, 12. So we're recommending that it not be authorized, Madam Chair. Okay, great, thank you. I'm gonna to go to Director Canodal. This was reviewed by my uh, APC. It's a um, temporary building, one of the uh, camp type structures. Uh, the APC is supporting that it moves forward to the uh, uh, ALC uh, as they support this kind of building for agricultural farm workers. So I am uh, moving that. Thank you. Okay, so Director Knoebel, it sounds like you're moving the alternate recommendation that this go forward to the ALC. Is there a seconder for this? Director Bush, thank you very much. Any questions or comments on this motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Okay, I will call the question then. This is a corporate vote. All in favor? Okay, thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B2, Agricultural Land Commission referral, non-adhering residential use at 1377 Fairview Road in Electoral Area C, CAO. C, 
single. We're not hearing you, CAO. Try again. I suppose I should just leave that on. Um, so this is a 1.8 hectare parcel that has two single family dwellings on it right now. They're proposing to demolish those to create uh, um, uh, agricultural worker housing. Uh, and it would be about 217 square meters, which is again is over the 90 square meter cap in the area C zoning bylaw. And then they're also proposing to build a new single family dwelling that would be 368 square meters uh, on this 1.8 hectare property which is right on the town of Oliver boundary. And of course, our regional growth strategy recommends that any uh, residential growth happen in incorporated communities. So we're recommending that it not be authorized to proceed, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, I'll go to Director Crowell on this. This one is similar to the other ones, but it has some differences, so I'm going to, but make the alternate recommendation that it goes to my APC for uh, consideration, please. Okay, thank you. So, Director Knodel is moving the alternate re recommendation to send this out to his uh, advisory planning uh, commission. I think Director Bush is seconding that. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments on this one? Okay, once again, it's a corporate vote. I'll call the question on the motion. All in favor? Thank you. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B3. Agricultural Land Commission referral non adhering residential use at 5475 Sumac Street in Area C. CAO? Yeah. 335 square meter uh, farm labor accommodation on our 2.8 acre property uh, does not comply with the area C zoning bylaw. We're recommending that it not be forwarded. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Knodel again. Go ahead, please. Once again, this one's similar, but has some differences. Uh, this is a, a kind of a frequent flyer here. So I'm recommending this one goes forward to my APC for their perusal. Uh, so I'm recommending the alternate, please. Okay, so thank you, Director Knobel is moving the alternate to refer to the Advisory Planning Commission. It looks like Director Pendergraft is seconding that. Thank you. Any questions or concerns? Okay, not seeing any. I'll call the question. It's a corporate vote. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll go to B4. Agricultural Land Commission referral, non-adhering residential use in Area H, CAO. So this does, this application for uh, farm worker accommodation does comply with the Area H bylaw. Uh, Madam Chair, we're recommending that this be authorized to proceed to the ALC. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Bob Coyne. I'll make the administrative recommendation. Okay, thank you. Seconded by Director Bush. Are there any questions or concerns with this one? Okay, it is a corporate vote. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. And is anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B5. Temporary use permit application 8715 Road 22 in Electoral Area A, CAO. This is an application for a renewal of a temporary use permit for uh, commercial outdoor storage in Area A, Madam Chair. Uh, it's been through the Advisory Planning Commission. Uh, they've recommended that it be denied, and uh, we are uh, also recommending that, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Pendergraft. Yes, thank you. I would... Uh, somebody's phone. <laughs> Good timing. I recommend, or I'm making the motion for the alternate recommendation on this one. And if there's a seconder, I'll explain. Okay, which, I uh, just want to have a look at the, which alternative? One or 
that it's approved. Oh, the alternative to approve the temporary use permit. Okay, and that's being seconded by Director Gettins, it looks like. Thank you. Okay, uh, Director Pendergraft, did you want to speak to this? Yes, please, to the chair. Uh, the APC did review this. Uh, they were supportive of it, but turned it down on the basis of the last time it was approved, there was a recommendation from, or a requirement from the RDOS to screen the facility, and that wasn't done. Uh, and that was the APC's big uh, issue with the application. So as long as the screening requirement is actually done this time, I'm supportive of it happening. I do not see this property being rezoned to accommodate this use. So this is really their only alternative and probably the last uh, opportunity for this renewal. So I would support it on those bases. Okay. Um, I guess my question or comment is from reading the report, it says that the owners have had, you know, the three year TUP and it's given them time to determine the viability of this land use and that they should be applying for a rezone. Um, Director Pendergraf, you had mentioned that you, you don't see that happening. Is it, do you have a reason why they don't want to apply for a rezone? Or, or staff? Oh, is it, is that if, if I click through the chair, I, I don't. I don't see it as they don't want to apply. I just suspect that a rezoning would not be recommended by staff, wouldn't be supported by the community either. It is an agricultural property. The use that is happening right now with the temporary storage is easily stopped in the future and it probably should go back to agriculture in the next few years. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody? else have a question or comment? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, we do have a motion on the floor to approve the temporary use permit. This is a rural vote. So I'll call the question then. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll go to B6, Official Community Plan Bylaw Amendments, ALR Exclusion Applications, CAO. Do the Agricultural Land Reserve Act, Madam Chair, so in our mind, it's sort of a housekeeping thing, just bringing it into compliance. So uh, we're recommending that uh, the bylaw uh, 2913 um, be uh, uh, move for first and second reading and then it come back before the board on March 4th. Right, okay. So looking for um, the rural director to move this. Director Gettins is moving it, thank you. Is there a seconder? Director Coyne Sr., thank you. Any questions or comments on this? Uh, yes, Director Sentis, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, we can't hear you. There we go. Yes, yeah, I think we're good. Go ahead. Um, the documentation that I have in my agenda package, number five, and this number six, as corporate vote, you're calling it a rural vote? Uh, so is there something wrong somewhere? Uh, my package says rural vote, so we'll have to ask Ms. Malden. I have rural vote in mine as well. I can look back and see if something different went out perhaps, but uh, <clears throat> my records indicate it's a rural. I, I apologize for the confusion. Mine, mine very clearly says corporate vote for who knows what reason, but thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Director Sentis. In the um, agenda that had gone out with a package, it does say it's a, a corporate vote, right. um, which is also what it says for item number five. Um, 
So that does appear, I think, to be a typo, Ms. Malden. Uh, on my actual hard copy given to me this morning, it was corrected to rural vote. Okay. So that must have been what happened then. My apologies. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Director Sentis. Um, uh, but we're still looking at a rural vote. So thank you for that. Uh, Director McCorda, go ahead. Did you have a question? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say that on my sheets, it also says that uh, both of those five and six are unweighted corporate votes. So I'm yes. feeling the same way as Director Santos. Thanks. Yes. That's all right. Yeah, I won't it, vote. It obviously went up. Well, you could. I, we're just not going to count. <laughs> <laughs> you put your hand up. That happens a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, so obviously it went out with, with uh, a couple errors there, but they were corrected with what I've got here. Okay, so we know it's a rural vote. It's been moved and seconded. Any further comments or questions? Okay, I'll call the question then. All in favor? Sue, did you just vote? Okay, anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. B7, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Electoral Area H, Bylaw Number 2498.16, CAO. Okay, so this was the subject of a public hearing this morning, and it's really to update the Area H uh, Zoning Bylaw, uh, some typing mistakes and uh, a change to the maximum floor area, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so from what I understand, uh, at second reading, the bylaw did not include a reference to, and I may have to get some help here from uh, Mr. Garish, but I don't think it uh, included uh, a section that was discussed this morning, which was a uh, split zoning, I think. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna suggest, Madam Chair, is that uh, somebody put this bylaw on for third reading and then um, Mr. Gary should come on and explain uh, any amendments that he needs and then somebody could move an amendment to third and then if that's approved uh, we could go back and pass the main motion as amended but uh, we need the bylaw on the floor first we need Mr. Garish to explain what the amendment is at third and then uh, we can proceed from there. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Garish did send this all out to the director members and uh, Director Bob Coyne is also being looped in on this. So I'll go uh, first to Director Bob Coyne on the main motion. I can make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, it's being moved. Is there a seconder? Director Roberts is seconding. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor. And um, any questions or comments? We have Mr. Garrish in, have we got him in? Okay. Uh, maybe it would be a good time to hear from Mr. Garrish on these uh, amendments to schedules A and B, I believe. Oh, we're not hearing you. Now, if we have oh, to know, is he not? Is he not on? We can see him. We're just waiting to hear him. <laughs> okay. Oh, he's dialing in with his phone now. Hang yep. on. Can you uh, can you hear me now? We've got you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll be quick. There's um. There are some amendments that we would like the board to consider at third reading. Uh, they involve uh, four properties in the Eastgate community. Um, the uh, civic addresses are 5058 Highway 3, uh, 110 and 112 Crystal Road, and 5070 Highway 3. And we want to adjust the zoning boundaries on these four parcels to reflect uh, the legal parcel boundaries of each property. And so this would result in um, uh, the, the removal of the split zoning between the CT1, RS1, and the SH4 zones. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Garish. 
Director Bob Coyne, would you like to make an amendment? So I'd like to move the items to third reading, please. Uh, well, we have third on the floor. I think what we need, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sayo, is a motion uh, to amend uh, based on what was submitted by Mr. Garish for, with uh, schedules A and B. Is that correct, Sayo? That is correct. Okay, so uh, just looking for a motion to amend um, at this time. I'd like to make the motion to amend the <laughs> motion as it is. Thank you, and I see Director Pendergraft is seconding that amendment. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, so I'm going to call the question on the amendment. All in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed to the amendment? Okay, that carries. And now I'm going to call the question on the main as amended. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Now we're going to go to B8, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Electorals Area. A, C, D, E, F, and I, Regulation of Metal Storage Containers, CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, so again, uh, based on what uh, Chair Canodal said this morning, um, I believe that he may want to have this uh, referred back to the committee. Uh, this is the container bylaw. So what we need to do is put a uh, third reading on the floor and then it can be referred back to the committee. Correct. Yes, I know there are some concerns still from different directors on this. So um, why don't I go to Director Canodal to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make the, the, the motion, please. Okay, so the motion for third. Is there a seconder? Director Gettins is seconding that. Uh, thank you. Now I'm asking if there's any further comments. Uh, Director Pendergraft, please. Thank you. Through the chair, I would make the motion for this to be referred back to committee for potential changes and further discussion. Excellent, thank you very much. Director Canodal, I believe you're seconding that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have uh, a motion to refer back to committee. I'll call the question. Uh, I'm just gonna check, Director Pendergraph, your hands still up from before, just clear, okay. So now I'm gonna call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B9. Zoning bylaw amendment 50818 8th Avenue in electoral area D, CAO. But Madam Chair, and it is back for adoption. Okay, we missed the start of what you were saying, I think. Could you try oh. that again? Yes, I was saying that this is the amendment for the Skaha housing uh, rezoning in Okanagan Falls, and it is back for adoption. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to go to Director um, Jim D'Andrea. I'd like to move the administrative recommendation be approved. Great, thank you. Is there a seconder? Director Monteith is seconding that, thank you. Any questions or concerns? Okay, this is a rural vote. I'll call the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B10, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 165 Snow Mountain Place in Area I, CAO. Uh, this was the other public hearing from this morning. This is on the subdivision of that duplex and it is back for third and adoption, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Monteith on this. And I'd like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, thank you. And seconded by Director Gettins. 
Thank you. Any questions or comments on this? This is a rural vote with a two thirds majority. Call the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B11. Petition to enter service area 1316 Green Lake Road and 289 and 299 Gold Tile Road and 525 Johnson Crescent in area C. CAO. This is the extension of the Willowbrook Water Service, uh, Madam Chair. And I just want to give Director Canodal a prompt here. Right. I see Director Canodal has a hand up. Go ahead, please, Director I, I, I have to recuse myself. Yeah, I think you're a property owner. Okay, so <laughs> Director Canodal is gone from the screen. Um, his hand's still up. So if he can hear me, take the hand down and also mute. Yes, he's muted. Okay, thank you very much. Back to you, CAO. Uh, so this is for first, second, and third reading, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Is anybody willing to move this? Director Pendergraf, are you moving this? Thank you very much. There's a seconder for this. Uh, Director Spencer Coyne, thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, this is a corporate vote. I'll call the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. We're gonna go on to B12. Um, hopefully, I think Director Canodal's probably back. <laughs> hopefully he saw the vote, the hands. There he is, we got him back. Okay, thank you, Director Canodal, you're back. Uh, we'll go on to B12, petitions to amend service areas, electoral area I and D, CAO. So this is an amendment to the Cleveland Fire Department service area and the Okanagan Falls Fire Protection Service area, and it's to move one property from Okanagan Falls into the Cleveland service, and they're both back for adoption, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll go to uh, Director Monteith on this one. And I'd like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, great, thank you. And looking for a seconder, uh, I see uh, Director DeAndrea is seconding it. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments on this? This is a corporate vote. I'll call the question, all in favor? Thank you, has can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B13, petition to enter service area in electoral area H, CAO. This is an extension of the area H fire protection service area around Princeton, and we contract with Princeton to provide that service. So this is to add one property at 280 Bonland Road. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Bob Coyne. I'd like to make an administrative recommendation, please. Okay, thank you. I see it seconded by Director Pendergraft. Are there any questions or comments? This is a corporate vote. Call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Okay, that takes us down to C, Public Works. C1, Campbell Mountain Landfill Master Plan and Design Operations and Closure Plan Update Award, CAO. Exactly that, Madam Chair. And we want to award to Sperling Hansen Associates for uh, $82,264. Okay. Um, and I see it also includes a contingency of 20000 Looking for someone to move this. Director Gettins is moving it. Director Canola is seconding. Any questions or comments? If this is a weighted corporate vote. Call the question. All in favor? Great. Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. 
We'll go to C2, award of RFP for utility crane truck, CAO. Yeah, this is the award for the uh, chassis part of the utility crane truck. We had previously awarded uh, the body and the crane, and uh, now we want to award the chassis to Orchard Ford for $66,168. Okay, thank you. Looking for a mover for this. Director Pendergraf is moving. Is there a seconder? Director Spencer Coyne seconding. Thank you. Any questions or comments? This is also a weighted corporate vote. Call the question. All in favor? Ask you to come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us then down to D, CAO report. CAO? Nothing new for me, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. That goes down to E, E1 Chair's report. I got a few things to update folks on here. Um, just to uh, follow up on SILGA, uh, the SILGA executive has indicated that, uh, of course, this year's uh, AGM is going to be virtual and this year there are not going to be nominations from the floor so if you are interested in running for any of the executive positions you do need to get your name submitted by February 26 to be included in the vote the vote uh, would be happening ahead of the AGM so you can submit your name and uh, if you want a photo and bio to the general manager Allison. So just keep that in mind. You have until February 26th if you want to be part of that. Uh, on January 26th, I had the pleasure of joining via uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, West Kelowna Mayor and Council, uh, basically as my final role with the ORL as board chair of the ORL to do a joint announcement on their new city hall that's going to be built in West Kelowna because the ORL is a partner in that. And we are a one third equity partner. So that's going to be a beautiful new building that will have West Kelowna uh, Mayor and Council in there, City Hall, ORL. And they're also hoping to be including the MLA and MP for their area in that building in the future. So that was a wonderful uh, celebration there. January 27th, I know many of us here participated in the second Sickle Point Town Hall, which went very well. Uh, January 29th, CAO and I participated and, and many other mayors um, were involved in the discussion with Minister Osborne. And she was uh, requesting updates from each regional district and municipality, um, looking at what folks are doing for opportunities in their communities um, around COVID. We talked about our tech improvements. We talked about how we lost, uh, we had the ransomware attack and what that did to us. But that out of that has come an opportunity to improve our security and improve our technology. Um, we've gone to, as you know, live streaming this and also archiving the um, board meetings online that we didn't used to do before. So we've seen some opportunities come out of COVID and what it's done to us and our technology. So that was uh, great to hear from her and the other uh, mayors and board chairs. The past couple of days, uh, as I mentioned before, Director Oberick and I were online with the Electoral Area Directors Forum that was on Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, that's where that motion that I brought up in corporate services came out of. So we had some really interesting discussions around COVID restart money. Um, we talked again, this has been brought up in the past, whether we should be having a separate BC Electoral Area Directors Association that had mixed reviews. Uh, many of the longtime directors did not support that as they feel it does splinter us apart from um, all of the politicians in BC, that UBCM is our voice to the province. And um, we will, if we pass the motion here shortly, we will get that letter off to the Premier and UBCM and to Grace McGregor, our electoral area uh, voice on the COVID restart funding allocation. And also uh, many folks have seen in the news the um, difficulties experienced with 
PIB and uh, LSIB with COVID. We have reached out to them to offer our support should they need any support during this difficult time. We have also reached out to OIB and USIB to let them know that we are here to provide support should they experience any difficulties as well. Uh, that is my update from the past couple weeks. We will now look for, and I believe we have something coming, under director's motions. Are there any notice of motions? Yes, Director Bob Coyne, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Christy will, uh, she would please read the motion or notice a motion for me, please. So the motion is um, that staff prepare a discussion paper to identify key considerations for regulating sleeping accommodations in accessory buildings and in vehicles. For example, bunkies, mobile tiny homes and RVs. Thank you. Director Bob Coyne, go ahead, please. This has become a, a predominant issue <clears throat> out here in our resort areas, and especially in Tulamine and Osprey Lake area. I, I would really encourage everyone to Google Spunky and uh, find out what's going on there. These are little sleeping cabins that have no amenities except a bed and a light bulb usually um, but you can buy these online in BC and the first thing that you will read when you read it when you open it is that they will tell you you do not need a building permit anywhere in North America to have these such uh, buildings so I would really like everybody to to um, learn about those things because they are a very very common thing out here they're they're not supposed to have them but but there are lots of them. Um, the other thing is that we're experiencing, I know I haven't had direct um, issues with, with um, tiny homes as yet, but we do have quite a few alternate um, housing things here, like <laughs> buses, um, old RVs that have been uh, built into uh, permanent dwellings, which according to our bylaws, none of which are legal. But we had an incident this summer in Tulamine where we lost two people from an illegally built uh, structure with an illegally installed um, water heater. And if, if these types of things were legalized maybe people would be more apt to go and get professionals to install these sorts of things. You know, we lost two young people this summer because somebody was saving a couple of bucks. So I would really like to see this come back as a discussion and um, put some serious thought into it. The newer, the younger people that today, there's a lot of them looking at alternative um, a lot of people <clears throat> don't want to be married to a mortgage, so they're looking at alternative housing methods. So I really think that we need to, as a board, look at this and do, give it some serious thought. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Director Bob Coyne. So that's a notice of motion. We're going to see that back in two weeks as a motion and see if the board votes that through. Um, so that we can have a further discussion on that and see where things could go for Area H and possibly other electoral areas. Uh, so thank you, Director Coyne. Anybody else have a notice of motion to bring forward? Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands up. That would take us to E3, which is board members' verbal updates. Did any board members have an update you wish to provide from your area? Okay, not seeing. Oh, Director Canodo, go ahead, please. I think you're muted. Not so much an update, but I just like to pass on to the Penticton councillors a 
my best wishes to Jake Kimberly, who resigned, uh, and uh, please pass on our best wishes for his quick recovery. Thank you very much. He will be missed. Great. Thank you very much, Director Canodal. Anybody else to provide an update or comment? Okay, folks, that takes us to E4. E4 was added to your agenda, and that is the motion out of Corporate Services Committee this morning. And that uh, motion is to direct uh, staff to write a letter on behalf of the board to the Premier UBCM and CCing Grace McGregor, who's our EA Director uh, Representative, regarding COVID, COVID restart funding, uh, province-wide allocation. Director Pendergraf, are you moving that? Okay, it's being moved. Uh, Director Canodo is seconding that, thank you. Any questions or discussion on that? Okay, I'm therefore gonna call the question, all in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And anybody opposed? Motion carries. Okay, folks, that takes us to item F, which is adjournment. And we moved pretty quickly this afternoon. So if there is nothing further, oh, Director Knoll's moving to adjourn. Thank you. Director Robertson is seconding that. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Anybody opposed to adjourning? None. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again in two weeks. Take care. Bye now.